My name is Jane Guberman, and today is Wednesday, December 14th, 2016. I'm here with Rob Agus at his home in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Rob, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes, you do. As you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, and particularly your experiences and involvement in Verbrengen, and that and the impact that the Chavara has had on, both on your own life and on the larger Jewish community. I'd like to start by talking about your personal and family background and to flesh out a little bit who you were at the time that you got involved with Fabrengen. So let's begin with your family. When you were growing up, you were born in 1945 in Dayton, Ohio, correct? Right. Correct. Can you tell me briefly about your family when you were growing up? Tell me about your father and your mother, who they were. My father was a rabbi in uh, Dayton, Ohio, and uh, originally he was a rabbi to three congregations. <laughs> Two of them were Orthodox and one conservative. Out there? Out there. Uh, and he uh, created the, helped to move them forward in their thinking and, and the getting together. What do you mean thinking? Thinking about what? Well, at the beginning of his being there, it was 100% Orthodox, and the differences were between Galiziano and Litvish <laughs> and Russian. Uh, and they all had different ways, and he used to alternate in terms of going to the different places. And not only did it have to be in Yiddish, but it, there were different uh, tones in Yiddish and different ways of expressing yourself. Right. So he had to get it exactly right, because that's what people want. <laughs> and then they, he saw an opportunity to create a new synagogue. So eventually he brought all the, together and they uh, formed one synagogue called Beth Abraham United. Sounds like quite an accomplishment. Yeah, well, of course, he spoke Yiddish from uh, early days. He was from Poland and uh, went to Yeshiva in Bialystok, uh, where he had eating nights at people's homes. <coughs> the old-fashioned way. His family itself was extremely uh, observant and uh, knowledgeable. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he himself uh, was committed to Jewish learning from a young child. Uh, and uh, they continued. Then they moved to from uh, Shishlovich, who was the name of the town, and moved from Shishlovich to, uh, and spent a lot of time in Bialystok. So we always had Bialystok bagels. It's a way to remember our <laughs> heritage. <laughs> yes. So, uh, which has gone out of business, you know, Bialys. And when they started calling them Bialys, that's when it got destroyed. The Bialystok has a bagel, so that's it. Anyway, uh, so the, uh, family moved uh, to the United States, but first they w moved to Palestine. And, uh, and they like to s tell a story of how when they got off the ship, they fell to the ground and kissed the earth, the, the, holy, the holy land. Uh, let's see, he was, uh, it was the mid-20s, 1920s, 25, in fact. They couldn't get enough visas for the family. Only my uh, Zaidi got his, and he came over. And the others moved into the area around Tel Aviv. <coughs> and uh, essentially studied at yeshivas, and the same yeshiva had a branch. And, uh, and Why did they go with that place? <coughs> uh, because it had become very difficult to live in that part of Poland by that time, basically. And uh, it was a chance also to be in the, in the Kadosh, be in the holy place. Yeah. They were Mizrahi type uh, people. So anyway, uh, the, my father, my grandfather moved to New York. Uh, he came on a passport suggesting that he was a rabbi. Why did he leave Israel, Palestine at that time? Well, the goal was to come to America, 
uh, after they'd been in a little while and they realized that they, they were not people for the earth in the sense of being farmers and it, it wasn't for them. Um, <clears throat> but it was difficult. You couldn't get a visa right away. You had to have meet various conditions. So when conditions were met, they were able to come move to Brooklyn. And uh, he had a, a show that he was the, the rabbi of for a little while. Well, what decade are we talking about now? The late 20s. They came in 1927. The family came. Which is when, of course, Babe Ruth uh, hit 60 home runs. But my father, living in there, had no idea <laughs> of that. Uh, later in life, he would always the challenge the members of the congregation to see if they could uh, f get something he couldn't answer. So it was always in baseball. <laughs> so we used to, act, I'm jumping ahead a number of years, we used to prepare him for this event as much as possible. <laughs> he did pretty well. He learned a lot, I'm sure. Yeah. And uh, the family, the congregation members were ecstatic that, you know, the rabbi knew so much. But he knew about everything, so it was not so unusual to us. To... Mm -hmm. So uh, the family consisted of four boys, uh, three. Your family, now you're talking mm -hmm. about you. Oh, no. Oh, no. You're talking about him still. Yeah, their family. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did a different thing. Uh, may know about Irving Agus, mm -hmm. was a Jewish historian, scholar. Uh, to me, the most interesting thing is he was working with the, the Fischl Institute, Harry Fish, to see if they could come up with a uh, code of laws that was both acceptable to secular thinking people and to Jewish heritage. So it's something that he tried to do. And then when she came to America also and stayed here. So very progressive for someone with his background. Well, they was, he was hoping to maintain orthodoxy, and this was a way to try to do that. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, the, uh, the family was very close, and they, they lived in Borough Park. It wasn't the Borough Park of today, it was the Borough Park of then, which was still very orthodox, but not everybody and different degrees. It wasn't a, a Hasidic place, it was a Litvisha place. And uh, <clears throat> my, so we do, we do more about him in the course. It was very much, my life was very much focused on. Right. So when did he go to, uh, to Dayton, Ohio? Dayton, Ohio, he went in 1940. He had spent a few years in Chicago. He, he went to, he graduated to Yeshiva, and uh, his first position was in Norfolk, Virginia, which was a strange place to be. He was not married at the time and had never, of course, cooked or anything like that. Uh, but he was there for a few years. Um, it was a regular synagogue, and he was the rabbi. And he was married by then? No. <clears throat> no. wasn't married yet. He decided to pursue a PhD uh, in history and philosophy of religion uh, at Harvard. His teachers were Harry Wolfson you know, and William Hawking, a white guy. His learning in uh, going back to the yeshiva and so forth because it comes together was uh, Bialystok, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, teachers that were most important to him were the Soloveitchik family lived there and came over before his family did. So when he got to the yeshiva here, uh, his teacher was Moshe Soloveitchik and he received his... Uh, his uh, what are you pointing to? I'm pointing to the... Uh, uh, graduations to speak, the, you know, in uh, a Jewish learning that he was a Rav. That he was a Rav. Yeah, that he was a serious one. He was both uh, Yori, Yori, and Dia, that he was, really knew the law. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> but he became friends with uh, Yosef Soloveitchik. And uh, they used to get together for a uh, 
the two of them studied Rambam, both from a religious perspective and a, a philosophic perspective. And uh, then eventually he met my mother. She came from a similar background. Born in, grew up in Boston? In Boston. She was born in Boston. My father was, you know, obviously not born in Boston. But she was born in Boston. Her father was a Litvisha person of great standing and morality and learning. Uh, and they met, and she had, was a beautiful woman and was absolutely convinced that she was not going to marry a rabbi. She was the belle of, you, you know, of this community. She didn't want to be the rab rabbi's wife because it was a very difficult world for the rabbi in those days. And anyways, just didn't want it. So she met him at a party and they started talking about what he was doing at the time. He was then learning about Hermann Cohen. And she was fascinated by it. So they would go take rides on the, the streetcars and talking about Herman Cohen. So I was, that's pretty unusual. <laughs> so that's how she got smitten. Smitten, yeah. And he was smitten too. So she got married, they married in 1940. Uh, at the time he was, then he went off, he was Harvard, and got his PhD from Harvard. And uh, he was very close with the head of the Yeshiva University, uh, Revel. And uh, they picked a, point, a place for him to go, which was in Chicago, at a Orthodox synagogue in Chicago. That uh, he was there a few years, and uh, she came and met him. And they, there and came back. They got married, and Miss Adair Kedushin was uh, Yosef uh, Salvechik, which he didn't do. He was not that kind of rabbi, but this was somebody special. So they uh, lived in Chicago for a few years. Life was a little difficult. The particular show they had, they had a few members who were very tough to be, live with. Yeah. So the uh, opportunity came to build a new synagogue in Dayton, and that's where they went, and then to Baltimore in 1950. So let's, let's get to Baltimore, because that's where you grew up, essentially, right? You yes. were five when you, when you came to Baltimore? No, I was, yeah, five, right? Five, yeah. And you have older siblings as well. I have an older you? brother, an older sister, and a younger sister. Right, okay. Um, what do you remember about Baltimore as a young child? It was, uh, you know, a southern city. Segregation officially lasted there till 1954. Do you remember being aware of the segregation between? Oh yeah, the we races? were very aware. Uh, many things about it uh, was shocking to us. As um, children. As children, yeah. Can you give me a few examples? Well, one I like to cite was. Uh, <clears throat> We wanted to go to a particular movie downtown. The big pl movies were downtown, and the other ones were neighborhood ones. And this was, it was going to be our first time going to a fancy schmancy uh, downtown movie theater. It was Gone with the Wind. How old were you, more or less? Uh, about eight, maybe. And we got there, and our, our maid, everybody had a maid of our stage. And uh, uh, she, she agreed to go with us because our parents wouldn't let us go by ourselves. Who was your maid? Tell us about your maid. Mabel. Mabel? And she was a classic woman. She was born in North Carolina. There was a difference between you were either from North Carolina in one part or the other part or South Carolina. They're all different. She was from North Carolina, a very religious woman. And she used to walk around the house singing, uh, you know, uh, gospel type music. Mm -hmm. African American. You're, yeah. She was African American. And had a beautiful voice. And uh, I think all of us liked her, that she dang, sang that, but nobody would admit it. <laughs> but she was a very wonderful woman. So, anyway, she said she'd be willing to take us there. So we get there, and the people at the door said, everybody can come in except for her. 
pointed the finger at Mabel. And why, why can't she go? Because black people or whatever, colored people, aren't allowed in. And we were all shocked. You know, it's just, how could, we knew her and we all knew her as a person, not as a black woman, but as a person. Anyway, so we thought about it and we decided, we the kids, that if she couldn't go, we wouldn't go. So we went away. It was a big deal because we wanted to see that movie, <laughs> Gone with the Wind. But How did she respond when you did that, when your children decided that? She was unhappy because she wanted us to be happy. But we told her, we're not going to go without you. But that was a first time, and then I remember a lot after uh, Brown versus Board of Education. So the 50s. Yeah. But in, unlike other places, it, the Supreme Court made its decision, let's say, on a Monday. By Wednesday, the schools were desegregated. It was right away. There was no resistance, formally. And informally, there were... Uh, these guys from the hills of West Virginia who his family had come up to Baltimore and they chased her, chased black people, not her, she didn't go there, but other kids, back and forth. I remember that, back and forth, they chased the kids, back and forth, yelling, screaming. Back and forth where? In front of the school? In, in the yard of the school, yeah. And again, it's just something unimaginable to us, you know. Yeah. Was there discussion about it in your home? Yeah. And my father explained this as well, historically what happened and so forth. And we don't treat people that way, but that's the way it is. So, yeah. Um, what was it like, uh, can you describe the Jewish community a little bit in Baltimore at the time? Well, the Jewish community, uh, Baltimore had a strong Jewish community. Um, the strongest part at one point had been Reform Jews, actually, but that wasn't the case when I was there. They were, there were several large Reform synagogues, temples, they called them. Um, and we, we really didn't know people that lived, they went to there. <laughs> it was a very selective community. We knew certain people, we didn't know other people. And there was also a show called the Sheri Saplita, the remnant of the destruction, the people who came from uh, the Holocaust. What was it called? Uh, its real name, I don't... In fact, I didn't know anything about it, uh, except it was these very odd-looking people who were very deeply engaged in what they were doing. They weren't interested in talking to us. We weren't interested in talking to them. But for the rest of the community, there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, and your father's synagogue at that point was conservative, is that correct? Yeah, there was a new synagogue, a uh, new community, mm -hmm. and they wanted a, the, uh, there was one large, officially conservative congregation, Hizuk Muna. Mm -hmm. The best thing about Hizuk Muna is when they announced what places were closed due to a snowstorm or something like that, the radio guys would say, Chickamagunga, or something like that. It was nothing close to Hizakamuna, you know, Takashwahuna Muna, or something. <laughs> anyway, they, uh, so the, my father founded Bethel Congregation, it was called. He didn't found it, but he got there, there were 50 families, and over the years it grew, and he was no longer the rabbi. There were 1,500 or 1,600 families. Yeah. 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 So your family moved into a neighborhood where restrictive covenants had um, earlier forbidden Jews from living, correct? Yes. Um, what do you remember about the character of your community and the impact of such legal restrictions and impediments on Jewish life? Well, things moved quickly. And so by the time we were there, or at least that I was old enough to to see who the neighbors were, uh, they were, it had become largely Jewish. Our, our what block part of town did you live in? It was called Ashburton. I don't know if you remember the movie uh, Liberty Heights? That's the street we lived right off of. So Jews were in a complicated environment. Um, 
at this time in terms of their own acceptance in the broader community. All these things were changing, restrictive covenants, etc. And they were, in your words, of mixed opinions regarding racial segregation. Well, there were some people whose whole family was from Baltimore, and in that sense, Baltimore is still kind of a southern place. So, uh, and then there were other people like us from New York or who here or there, who didn't imagine that you'd be live in a place like that. You know? Would you say that the growing awareness of the Holocaust and what had happened to East European Jewry affected Jewish attitudes towards? the rights of people of blacks and, and, and others during this time? I'd like to say that. I don't think that had anything to do with anything. Not quite. No. Not yet. Okay. Um, so, as you've been saying, your father was uh, an ordained Orthodox rabbi with some rather, in a sense, unorthodox ideas about um, halakha and Jewish practice. And he actually went on to serve both Orthodox and conservative synagogues in his career. How would you describe the Jewish environment in your own in your home when you were growing up? Well, we certainly knew we were Jewish very much. Um, it was important to to him and to my mother that we learn secular stuff, material as well. View ourselves as Americans, we did certainly saw ourselves that way. But at the same time, we were obviously Jewish. Uh, those are the people we knew. We didn't know non-Jews. As kids, we didn't know them. Mm -hmm. in the, the city itself, it, you, it wasn't a problem. But, and it wasn't a problem for us if you just what it was. And we actually liked it. it was, you were safe everywhere. It was, you knew most of the people from the show, you know. Uh, and um, the kind of Judaism that we learned was very intellectual, as well as the normal practice of being a mensch. Um, but people were mentioned in different ways. Uh, there was one guy who was the, owned a uh, business that had uh, smoked fish. And we knew it when he had to visit. <laughs> he, a couple times a year, would invite my father to come down to the, and they would talk, Tyra. And, uh, He's, when my father would come back, my mother would grab the suit that he was wearing and threw it into the... <laughs> it had a big smell. And to this day, I dream of those kinds of fishes, you know. Uh, there was one fish that's called everywhere in the world except Baltimore at that time, I don't know why, called uh, sable, which is a very strong... But in Baltimore, in the Jewish part, it was called revelation. Revelations? Revelation fish, revelation. I thought that was so fantastic. <laughs> and made in my mind the whole concept that this, we're eating this fish and we're becoming closer to God from this fish and the herring and the smoke. To, you know. So uh, things like that made you feel very happy. It was a happy life in that sense. You would go to different bakeries for different types of bread. My son is uh, following those habits. He's uh, very oriented to what different opportunities for tasting things and things. And we all did. Yeah. My mother was a wonderful cook. And, uh, but there was one night a week when Mabel, the maid, would uh, cook uh, some ch fried chicken. It was very good. Did, did Mabel cook um, sort of Jewish dishes as well? Uh, no, no. So your mother cooked? Yeah. Mother. And Friday night, what was Friday night like in your home? Friday night was, uh, Friday night began Friday morning <laughs> when with the cleaning of the, of the chicken. That also has a special smell. We used to come right out heading to school and with the smell in each of the houses was of chicken soup and roast. At least it felt like, it felt like it was everybody, I'm sure it wasn't, but it seemed that way. And it was a unifying force to have knew that you were going to have chicken that night, and uh, with the soup and the kanedlach and everything, the kogels. What did you mean when you said that you grew up with a very intellectual Judaism as well? My father was exceptionally 
focused on the nature of God and human beings and the ability for us to be in a holy place in our own in our lives from little kids to big kids and at the same time learning later philosophy but earlier economics uh, mathematics and it was important <clears throat> But most important was to recognize the presence of God in our lives and the challenge that we had to be, to take, to grow, to learn, to experience the world in a positive way, knowing that not everything is positive. There would be occasionally survivors who would come to the house asking for money, and they always got money. There was this one guy who used to sell uh, knives that you could cut meat with or something. And uh, he would come on a regular basis. On a regular basis, my mother would buy another knife, totally unnecessary. <laughs> or there was a time my brother was older, and he had a, a car at one time. Kind of a... But to buy it, he was going to make a deal with this guy, and the guy really needed the money. So my brother dropped the price a little bit, uh, raised the price a little bit, because he could see that's his. And so the person came to the house and my father said, so what did my son agree with? And told him, he said, what do you think? It's, the guy said, I can't afford that much money for the car, but we really need a car. My father said, okay. And he dropped the price further. And my brother came home and, you know, my father said, you had a chance to do a great mitzvah, and I knew you'd want it. <laughs> so that was that. There were no discussions like that. You know, he was the rabbi for us as well as in the community. Your parents also hosted a variety of people, intellectuals and others who came through. Do mm -hmm. you have memories of those? Occasions, and were you present as children? Yeah, we all uh, sat at the same table and uh, learned from the people. Who were, we were encouraged to ask questions. And uh, I remember particularly uh, uh, Mordechai Kaplan, who was a big guy. He was tall and athletic looking. Uh, and he would say something and then we'd say, I'd raise questions, and he'd say, well, you know, that's the way it is in the world. I said, no, you don't have to change the world. <laughs> so uh, he enjoyed that. Later years, I met him, and he, he's, he remembered those uh, times. And you certainly do. Yeah, Indeed. though they were all characters. Yeah. It was... Um, uh, when Rabbi Heschel... We had relationships with him were interesting. He clearly came out of a tough life and was trying to absorb how he would make it in, Amer in the Jewish community. Because the way he got hired as, was by the HUC, the Hebrew Union College hired him. He wasn't the seminary. It was later the seminary, but... Uh, <clears throat> and he was... Uh, from a Hasidic background as well, but he also came from a philosophical school of thought, so that he and my father had many things in common. Uh, and for a number of years, the B'nai B'rith had adult education uh, orientation, and the two of them were a team. They would go to various places. The, the B'nai B'rith had uh, camps. And uh, sometimes families would come, and the people, the adults would come for lectures, and the two of them would give lectures and study things. One time, uh, I was getting bored. I sat through most of those things, and we were talking, you know, 10 years old, maybe something like that. Uh, and uh, I left from the room there where they were, and it was kind of a dark night, and I decided I should go back but I was lost. It was all dark. So for, I looked more and more. Actually, I was younger than that. Yeah, I was like five, six, seven, something like that. Anyway, 
So I was looking, 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 and I lost, and then they realized that I wasn't there, and everybody went out to, there were no lights or anything, you know. So uh, I started to scream, and eventually they decided to divide up, and he came by where I was, Heschel. And uh, you remember, I don't know if you knew, he had this big hair, and so he was standing, and the light was coming from the moon, and I really started to scream now. And of course, he felt terrible. The more he did to get close to me, the more I... <laughs> he, ne he never forgot it. Every time I saw him later on, he, he did it. We had this... Uh, we had for Brangen for a period of time, and uh, I ran into him at one occasion. And he said, you know, it's a good thing that you're raising questions about the war and things like that. I know your father, my father is very anti-war, Vietnam War. Uh, and then, but he said, but try to remember that the only thing we have are words. What we have are words. And uh, you should listen to your father and you know, absorb and, and, the, and try to get your, your cohort meaning the Fabrangan people, Jewish observ uh, opponents of the war, to remember that even though you're doing a good deed in opposing the war, you have to be careful of the words you use, because that's, that's what our power lies in. And as long as I'm talking about that, I, uh, one time my father came home from a visit to New York, because he had been told that Heschel was very sick. And he got there to see him, and they talked for a while. Then it was clear that Eshel was in bad shape. So he said he would like to see me before he, things go further. Heschel said. But uh, yeah, I didn't get to see him. So I always wondered what he wanted to tell me. <laughs> but it, we knew, I knew lots of those people that came through, so to speak. And uh, it was interesting. Yeah. What kind of Jewish education did you have when you were young? So I had a normal after-school uh, Hebrew thing, which mm -hmm. was very limited. Uh, and then I, the Bal Baltimore Hebrew College. Mm. Did you go to any Jewish summer camps, for instance? Uh, I went to Camp Ramal for one year. Which one? Where? In uh, Poconos. How old were you at the time? Actually, I was. I just finished uh, high school, so I was in a program called Madur, Madur or something. What it was called. Did it have any impact on you? Had you ever been in that kind of an environment before? Well, we, as a family, we used to take vacations. Uh, I was telling you before. There's our picture of the. Shul in uh, Loon Lake, New York. In the Adirondacks. In the Adirondacks. And uh, it, was, it was a wonderful, it is a wonderful and was a wonderful place. Uh, my father wrote a number of his books sitting on the porch. So you're saying you experienced So that was an ex yeah. in that environment. In a traditional, very traditional background. We were the only non-Orthodox <laughs> You were the only one? Non-Orthodox family, so to speak. It's very... Yeah. But it, everybody took care of everybody. It was wonderful. Yeah. Um, so and it is wonderful. It's still going on. Yeah. So what would you say were the most formative influences on your Jewish identity when you were growing up? Well, just being in the house was... Sounds like your father was... My father place. and my mother, uh, my mother took, was a graduate of the Boston Hebrew Teachers College. She was the number one, she was the highest ranking. There were lots of men, not too many women, but she uh, was the person. And, and my father, of course. And she went on to teach, is that right, in Jewish schools? Well, she... Uh, when she graduated and they got married, basically. So she was the principal of the schools at, in Chicago and in Dayton. 
and, and initially in Baltimore too. Mm -hmm. okay. So you went to high school at Baltimore City College, which was an all-male school, correct? Yeah. Um, and from there you went on to Johns Hopkins. Right. Can you tell us just briefly um, about your, this general education and what impact these schools had on, on your sort of developing interests? Well, with City College was a you know, all-male school, as you said, and uh, they had created a special program. Actually, Johns Hopkins had created a special program for the higher ranking students mm -hmm. called the A-Course which meant the advanced college, pre 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 preparatory school, something like that. Anyway, as an example, we took Latin for four years <laughs> every day. That just was not done anymore. That's what it used to be, you know. But that's the kind of, we had, and we had all, teachers who mainly taught mainly just in the A course. There was, and they were all characters of the, uh, the Latin teacher, Mrs. Schiff <laughs> was a German Jew, uh -huh. and she went. She was an observant uh, re Reformed Jew, so she would not be in shul on the first day Yantif. By the second day, she was there, and she said, "And I, that's correct. Is the one day is correct? The two is false, and I will." accordingly take that into mind when giving you a grade. <laughs> but of course she didn't really do that. Yeah. Yeah. Was she the first reformed Jew that you sort of... That I remember, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There were more, but I didn't... As you say, an observant reformed Jew. Some of yeah. the serious Jews. Yeah, she was a serious, and that was the, yeah, yeah. There was another guy who was not Jewish, Mr. Chubb, but he had been informed about her about this one day business. So she said, he said to us in class, he was a big guy, very big guy. And he sat behind this desk, which was just big like that, and said, so I'm going to be walking through the Jewish neighborhood, because everything was Baltimore was very divided. Our block was 99% Jewish, you know. And that's, the whole area was like that. He said, and if you're not in, sh synagogue and you're not at home studying, where will you be? In trouble! <laughs> and he would pick up this desk like that and say, in trouble! <laughs> so, everybody was a kind of a character in those days, it seemed like it. <laughs> anyway, but in, uh, they, but they weren't uh, he, he was a bit of a, she was a bit of a scholar in her field, mm -hmm. and some better than others. Uh, but Hopkins had very small college, you know, you, it's a famous place, but as a, in those days, people just in the, lower, in the college part, not in the, inter, in the medical school or something like that, it, it was a small school. And we're talking about the early 60s, basically, now, right? Yeah. And I graduated high school in 62. And so we had, the same professor would be teaching graduate people at a very high level, was your teacher in a regular level. So it was quite demanding, um, but it was exciting, some of the people. That I, what, what did you study? Well, I remember very much the key class was History 1-2, uh, a missed uh, teacher, and uh, he was great. He, often when he was finished his lecture, we would rise and clap. And I, my heart would always beat more, because to have somebody with knowledge of all types, nothing was unknown, because that's what my father was, I knew everything. This guy was like that too, and I knew how to teach as well. It was just very, very, very exciting. And uh, the negative part was that uh, the teachers we had in, say, chemistry and physics and things like that were Nobel Prize people, potentially, or real. And here I didn't know anything in that. 
compare it because high school in those days was not so great. So anyway, it was a wonderful experience in its own way. Yeah. So yeah. this was a period of tremendous social ferment among yes. American youth and American society. You graduated Hopkins in 65. Right. Um, you have the development of the counterculture happening, the growing opposition to the Vietnam War, activism on behalf of the Civil Rights Movement. All of this is sort of bubbling around. And to what extent were you involved in any of these um, sort of social movements uh, well, or, or aware of them? Yeah, oh, I was certainly aware of them, uh, and some things more than others, but uh, we, I lived at home, so I didn't have the full experience, um, <clears throat> and we graduated in that program, it was a three-year program, so it was a lot of work, but I was very much aware of what was happening, and uh, started off uh, not being opposed to the war. I, it, when those days you were, educa the educated people were supporters of presidents and things like that. It was the nice thing to do. But that changed during that period of time. And after Kennedy was assassinated and we had Lyndon Johnson, uh, we were quite aware of the difference. I remember when he, several times he came to campus to make a presentation on support of the war and support of this and support of that because that was the, Baltimore was the big place that was not Washington. And uh, I remember shaking his hand. He had quite a grip. <laughs> and he was a big guy. Right? He was a big guy, yeah. And uh, we were beginning to become anti-war and by the end uh, it was part of all kinds of organizations to fight the war. Such as what? Students against uh, the war, you know. Mm -hmm. And were there protests happening already? Yes. On campus? On campus there were. Yeah. yeah. Not so much in, in town, because mm -hmm. the local political hacks were, were hacks. They weren't concerned about issues. Yeah. They were concerned about uh, uh, blacks and city and such, but that it didn't, wasn't so great, it became a big deal. Mm -hmm. But the war and things like that were important, yeah. And were they being discussed? Yes. Within your family? Yes. Uh -huh. And what was the attitude within your family? My father was a leader in the anti-war. Already, sort of in this early period, yeah. Um, so after graduating from Hopkins, you went to Yale for law school. How did you decide on law school? And what interested you about the law as a career direction? Well, I wasn't thinking so much of career, I was thinking of learning. <laughs> and uh, from my understanding of law, could be really at that point was Jewish law, it dealt with life and uh, goals, and we talked about before, you know, God's place in our world. And there's the secular, but the secular is affected by the religious. Plus, it was well known as the best law school. So I wanted to be at the best. I didn't think I'd get in, but uh, I, I did. So it was very exciting. Um. So when you arrived at Yale, were you already committed to the search for a process for social change? Yeah. I was going to see how the law could be a force for, for change and uh, address issues that were important. And what did you find? I found that the world was not just only little Baltimore <laughs> or the professors at, the, at Hopkins with all kinds of people. But uh, I had this wonderful experience where the first day that we were there, we were invited to a big dinner, a fancy schmancy dinner. But I couldn't eat anything. 
So uh, because it wasn't kosher. Because it wasn't kosher, and um, there was uh, there no alternative. You know, this is what it was, and that's what it was. So I could have water, and <laughs> it sounds so pathetic, but um, I was actually so interested in the fellow people and. Everybody was fancier than the next, and more interested in this or that. And uh, this fa fa guy sitting next to me on one side was just a fresh first year Yale Law, just as I was. And his father was next to him. And I noticed he had this an accent, so I asked where he was from. He was Pol from Poland. This is the father. Or? The father was from Poland. He was a Polish count. That doesn't mean that he knows one, two, three. <laughs> Means that he's, you know, could be king. Nobility. Nobility. And his son was no longer the count, but full of the same thing. It was just like me, because my father was from Poland, a little different, but we felt like we were the noble people as well. Our nobility was study and learning and things like that. Um, but we had things in common. So he became one of my best friends. And I wasn't eating the steak that they put in front of me, so I gave it to them, they ate it, and they gave me the, the dessert. I had two desserts, three desserts, <laughs> baked Alaska, which I thought was the strangest thing. What do you mean baked Alaska? If one would go to such a thing. It was delicious. What was it? It's uh, ice cream covered by meringue and with a chocolate sauce in addition. So something to really uh, stick your teeth into. <laughs> anyway, we became close friends and I, uh, I helped him through. He was not used to studying. He went to Princeton, but he didn't study the way he had to for law school. Law school was actually pretty easy. What do you think? Well, the idea of competition on an intellectual basis is so close to what we do. The kids did, you know, in a neighborhood, we all played base basketball, we were terrible. But uh, it was, we we're used to the banter going back and forth, some of it not to be repeated here, but uh, other not. It was, and it was fun, you know. And it was mainly not the, uh, the physical, it was the academic, it was the... the that's what we were used to. And that's what you needed in law school, <clears throat> at least in, in Yale Law School. Mm -hmm. That was the difference between Yale and other places. It was very intellectual. Who were some of the major influences on you and, and your thinking as it evolved over the course of your law school career? There were, uh, there was a guy named Alexander Mordechai Bickel, whose uh, father was a Yiddishist. Shlomo Bickel was his name. And uh, Alex Bickel was considered to be a future Supreme Court justice. Didn't become, he got sick at the end of his life. But he was sort of on the conservative side, people would say. He really wasn't. He just, he believed very much in the practice of the law and looking for the truth in it. You know, the. You, what will take this further along the path of good deeds and so things like that? He, almost like a rabbi. He would have. He. I said that once, and he said, "Don't ever call me that." <laughs> but it was a wonderful moment once. You know, when you prepare for Pesach, you bring all the chometz, and together you bedikets chometz. You search for the chometz that you've already buried, and uh, then you burn it when you get it. So we, I decided to do this in the courtyard of the law school, which is this medieval looking structure. <laughs> so he was walking by from one building to the next. I walked over to him. He looked up at me and I said, Alex, no, it's time for be or chometz. And I took out the chometz and put it down and I was about to light it. He took the matches from my hand and lit it and said the formula called the Wow. It was great. <laughs> and uh, 
when I graduated, my parents came for the graduation, and uh, we were walking up the steps to see the library, and uh, Bickle, when his, he had two daughters, was coming down the steps. He had married a non-Jewish woman. And we're going up, and we stopped, and he said, oh, who's this? And I introduced him. And he said, oh, I've heard of you. Of course, he, I've told him about him. But he, Said he heard, maybe he did, because he went to Harvard, which was full of Jewish people. Anyway, uh, and he introduced his daughters, and then he said to me, don't, you know, make sure you don't forget what you were raised to be. And it was, then he said, and it was a mistake that I made. <laughs> and he began to almost cry. You could see he was thinking, you know, on the verge of tears. And my father said, and I've heard of you, and you have great uh, honor and glory that you bring to this school. I wanted to ask you about, and he asked about a case. <laughs> Bickle smiled, he was at home. That's his thing. So he was one person. And very different from him was a guy named Charles Reich, who wrote a book called The Greening of America which was a bestseller and was considered a big deal. And uh, he was a liberal, very much a liberal, and Bickle was a conservative. So those were my two advisors. <coughs> uh. And one of them uh, was involved in what became Verbrengen, in that he I wrote a, a thesis called The New, El New Community at Yale, yeah. mm -hmm. the law school, and about how the whole idea was to try to, again, bring values to the table, make everything unified in terms of a common concept of what the world could be and isn't, and that in, in talked about many different fields. Uh, he was a genius. And who was your advisor for that? That was Charles Reich. Charles Reich. Yeah. Um, were you already then sort of grappling with the um, sort of interaction between Torah and Midrash very specifically in terms of its relationship to change and visions for change? Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? What, what, what were you grappling with? Well, on the one hand, you know, the halacha is theoretically straightforward. You just have to learn it. And the changes that might occur will be quite limited. In the, you know, women were not yet given all the rights and responsibilities, for example. Um, <clears throat> but Midrash is more free-flowing and can lead you down the path of... Uh, change that you wouldn't think you would do, that comes back into the halacha. At least I claim that was the case. So, uh, yeah, began to think about that. That was part of my new part community. Of the, part of your? New community concept. Uh, at first I was going to make it general, but then I thought I'd start with a Jewish neighborhood, a new Jewish neighborhood kind of thing. And then at that you evolved and evolved into Ferengen. Yeah, so we're going to come to that any second. Um, uh, while you were at Yale, you, you, you also continued your involvement in Jewish life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we had the Yale Kosher Kitchen. And this is uh, pretty funny. First we got to uh, Yale and uh, we thought that there was a, a regular kosher kitchen, which would mean that for every night. But it wasn't the case. They only uh, mainly had during the day and, uh, and, and nothing on Shabbos. They would all go back to their New York homes. They were or these Orthodox kids, and their parents had agreed they could go away to Yale, you know, a million miles away. Uh, only 90, but it was like a million miles away. And as long as they would come back for Shabbos, that would be okay. But they had to come back for Shabbos, so the kitchen was open for Shabbos. But not for the week. So, oh no, the other way around. Right. 
it wasn't open for Shabbos because they were all in New York. Right. And they weren't interested in, in the coach. And the Hillel rabbi was a reform rabbi, but an unusual reform rabbi. I guess so. Yeah. So, but he supported this approach. And he, he said he doesn't support having the kitchen be open on the weekend. He supported it not being open. Not being open. So I went to William Sloan Coffin, who was the chaplain for the university. He said, so Dick, I understand that da, 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 da. Yes, I uh, was kind of surprised to hear that. And I'd hate to have to go to the president with this. So we got the kitchen. And it became a focal point for uh, community, for Jewish people, but non Jews too came. My friend with the Pole, the Polish So anybody could go to it? Yeah. And it was wonderful. I mean, it was they were very observant. They, all their energy that used to be given over to the train going back before Shabbos was now into singing. And, uh, and one thing, my father was not a singer. So we didn't have, we had, my mother was a beautiful singer, but this was everybody was singing. And we were in the lower, in the basement level of the uh, Yale kosher kitchen place. And his, Dick and his family lived above and we made a racket because of the singing, you know. And he complained, and we said, you don't really want to complain, we'll go back to... <laughs> anyway, to his credit, he, he changed in the course of the uh, time that we were there. Yeah. Did you develop a relationship with him? Well, yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Because um, we, we started a Shabbos morning service, uh, and he came. Helped us and what kind know. of a service was that? How would you characterize it? It was a traditional. Traditional service. Um, you said that um, the Yale Kosher Kitchen was not formally a Chavara, but it had right. some well, the characteristics question, of it. Yeah, like. the, the, the question in that uh, sort of put it, it didn't say anything about something that wasn't a normal way of considering, you know, yeah prayer. But this was a, a community building structure. And people helped each other and became like family. Uh, and uh, were challenged by the place. The, those who came from an Orthodox background were clearly challenged by thoughts of whether women should participate and if the, everybody participated, what did it mean to be Jewish? And, so all of these were all these questions were on the table essentially. Yeah. Literally and figuratively. So to speak, yes. Yeah. Um, so when you look back on that experience, does it feel to you like a first experience of Chavara style Judaism? Yeah. I mean, I didn't know much about Chavara Judaism, although my cousin was involved in uh, the Boston. Your cousin Janet. 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 Involved in Chavarat Shalom, yeah, which was just starting, also. Yes. So, in, so the the Yale Kosher Kitchen was founded when? Well, if you take my theory of when it was uh, in the late sixties. Late sixties, yeah, and Chavarat Shalom was founded in in sixty eight. Yeah, and I graduated in sixty eight. Right, so it was in there. It sounds like yeah. it might have even predated I went, Chavarat Shalom slightly. I, I don't know the formal, but I did go visit uh, there, and I was very impressed by that. You went to visit Chavarat Shalom? I was very uh, interested in, in the organizational structure. They had a, one person who was clearly the equal above all other equals. Mm -hmm. Meaning uh, Art. Meaning Art Green. Uh, he was clearly <coughs> a, a figure of some importance. But on the other hand, the, the negative of somebody who's dominating in a certain sense, not, not intentionally, it's just that's the structure that they had come up with. Right. At that particular time, I'm sure things changed in the course of time. Yeah, he certainly did, and he was only there for right. a certain number of years as well. 
You were also exposed to non-Jews non, and non-Jewish religion yeah. to an extent while you were at Yale. Well, my, my Polish count friend <laughs> was very Catholic. And uh, he used to uh, talk about it. He, he would come to our to the kosher kitchen, and I would go to there. And I remember one particular time, <clears throat> they had outdoor davening on Easter. Wait, I'm confused. Who had outdoor davening? The Catholic. The Catholics. On they campus, had an outdoor service. They had it. They had like a chavara. They had a group of people who took their stuff more seriously than the rest, and uh, certainly the, the priests and all that. They had this. In, they didn't call it formally a you know a mass, but it was a uh, an exciting thing because the, the, when the sun rises, you know it's Jesus yeah. and all that stuff. And there was a great deal of history where. Polish Jews were uh, in trouble because of Easter, and there was usually a battle, you know, physical. So I woke up, so to speak, from a dream, and there they are. But it was beautiful, singing and with guitars. That's where I saw it's the first time the use of guitars in a liturgical environment. Yeah. And it was something I had in mind, so when I had a chance, I encouraged it. Later? Later. later. Yeah. What about Eastern religions? Did you have any exposure to Eastern religions um, or practices during that time? Not too much. I mean, I read some things that people said were as great and so on. I don't know. It didn't seem like much to me. Mm-hmm. And of course, the translations were terrible, and, mm-hmm. but necessary. Did you have any other experiences of going to non-Jewish services at that during this period? I went to some of the other stuff they had on campus, uh, but it was really the informal form out formal that was most attractive. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to get your reaction to uh, something that Rabbi Benzion Gold said. He was the director of Harvard Hillel at the t- at this during the same period. Um, and he was talking about the role of religion on campus in the 60s, and he, he said that faith in what he was calling a, quote, civic religion was really shattered during that decade um, because of the Vietnam War, because of the civil rights movement, counterculture, and also other things that were happening in American society, we, several assassinations of key people, the president, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, but he said at the same time, he found that this period was also witnessing a new pride in diversity that celebrated different uh, lifestyles and religions. So I'm curious how you respond to that and how that sort of resonates in terms of your own experience of the role of religion and religious life at Yale during this time. Well, uh, it was... Uh, it was interesting to me uh, that things would, could change. Um, it was felt at home with the, the environment. I was interested in what other religious people were thinking. That um, the limitations on formal religious things were evident. Uh, that it was questionable and so forth. But uh, on the same time, it was, uh, you know, there were people from the South who had great nigunim and uh, and concerned about making the world better. Yale went through a big process of change. The year after me, there was a whole big to do. But at, um, we had a group that was fighting the war. We had protest movements, and... Uh, and who's the we when you say we had? People who had come together, who had religious orientation, uh, and also the desire for change. But not necessarily only Jews. No. Uh, however, there was a time, um, the last year I was there maybe, and 
President Johnson had taken a Yale law professor and made him one of the assistant secretary of state. And I wrote him a letter. What was his name? His name was Rostow, uh, Eugene Victor Rostow. Eugene Victor, if you know American political history, it sounds like Eugene Victor Debs, who was a, a uh, pacifist almost and a person who dealt with problems in a real sense, sort of as a political thing. Anyway, uh, Eugene Victor Rostell, or Dean Rostell as he was called, was very well known because he was the first, one of the first people to be, Jewish people to be a dean at the Yale Law School. And then they had nothing but Jewish people. <laughs> but he was, he went for two terms and he was nominated to be the assistant secretary or secretary of HUD of the State Department. And uh, it was clear it was just cover, cover for the president. He wasn't interested in what Eugene Victor Rostow had to say, or Walt Whitman, his brother Rostow. You could see the father was a bit so socialist. Uh, <clears throat> so I wrote him a letter. Yeah, Rostow. Rostow, which was heir of uh, Yom Kippur, and also heir of him becoming this new position in government. So I said this was an opportunity to make tshuva for you and for the president and change the orientation and stop this stupid war and killing people and things like that. And uh, I showed it to a friend of mine and there and he said it was great and I said, oh, anyway. I came back a couple hours later into this community room and I saw up on the wall something that everybody was looking at and signing. And I went over to see what it was. It was my letter, my in write, handwriting, because I was a terrible typist. And it became, everybody came by and just now to sign it. They heard about it. So a day or two later, the New York Times had an article on the front page. Yale Law School says, stop the war. We didn't stop the war, <laughs> but we did affect a lot of people. A lot of people f remember that, and uh, yeah, you found a vehicle and a voice yeah. for um, your position. Yeah. So you graduated in '68. Right? Yeah. This was a period when anti-war activity was coming to a head on many campuses, and it was also a period when anxiety anxiety about the draft was rising exponentially. 69 was when the first lottery took place in December of 69. Um, and that was a year, the year, six, six months, a year after you had graduated from, from law school. Uh, what was your personal situation regarding the draft and how did you feel about it? When I was uh, seven years old, I uh, had an accident and push some of the parts of my body in the wrong place. Wasn't recognized as, as what it was. And later I had uh, an operation on my back to straighten the spine, something I had. To. So you weren't concerned? No way was I gonna. <laughs> okay. So it wasn't a personal concern? Well, the funny thing is about it, uh, I did get the notice to appear before the to the draft, board. draft board and to, to take a test and they told you when you got there that if you didn't do very well on the test it would prove that you did this deliberately and you'll be taken to building D <laughs> and sent immediately to Vietnam which is a joke in some sense but not much of a sense so I knew there was no way no no possible way I was 4 F 100 percent but it's amazing how your body and your your mind take hold of it. And I was, until they, so anyway, I knew I was not going to, I just knew it. But they said, you go over here. So I go over there and nobody else is going over there. It was the people who were going to be 4F. And the doctor 
closes the door and he's this little guy like that and closes the door and he says congratulations <laughs> so anyway so I knew I wasn't going but it, even then it was uh, frightening oh for sure yeah um, I just wanted to ask you whether there um, were outside of your um, you know school environments whether there were people whom you, or events that you consider uh, to have been particularly formative influences on you during the 60s. Um, you've mentioned Sant Peschel um, and other political figures or leaders. So there are people who you feel made a particular impression on you and, and your thinking. Well, as I mentioned in the law school, it was the two professors, very different. But, but both made a big impact on me. Mm -hmm. Charles Reich. Mm -hmm. The Greening of America was a bestseller. Yeah. Uh, and it, what about political figures? Were there people who were particularly, um, made particular impressions on you by Kennedy? I worked uh, for uh, McCarthy first, mm -hmm. Senator McCarthy. Mm -hmm. And then when Bobby Kennedy announced uh, changed my support to him, mainly because I thought he would uh, win, whereas uh, McCarthy was too, uh, too full of himself to, to win. So I was glad that Bobby Kennedy entered into it. I knew some people who were involved in that, and I was, going to, I was on target to uh, work for him for his election. But of course he was assassinated. And, assassinated. and uh, I was watching it on the... That was just as you were graduating? A year after I graduated. Year. So that was a big shock and a terrible thing. Uh, and I was watching him get ready to give his talk in Los Angeles. They were, had the cameras because, you know, he's an important guy. And then all of a sudden he's shot. I mean, you saw it on the TV. Yeah. Happened. And uh, it was quite something. But life goes on. Indeed. And so so let, let's turn now to uh, focus on how you became involved as one of the founders of Fabrengen and your experience as a member. So in 1970, uh, you headed to Washington for a job. Uh, yeah, I got a job. Uh, for my first job at a law school was with a, in Baltimore, uh, and as a professor who uh, became an activist in the government. And he, his job was head of uh, what was called housing and community development, and I was the special assistant. So this was a very quiet little nothing uh, project, but we both came at it to change Baltimore, which was this sleepy southern-like town, you know, not totally, but enough. And there was uh, the political structure was pro-war, and and uh, black people didn't have much opportunity. And this uh, housing was terrible for poor people. So we had a lot to do. And uh, it was exciting. It wasn't exciting after work. There was nothing to do. <laughs> In Baltimore. In Baltimore. Yeah. It was not yet all the th people say about Baltimore now. Oh, wow, you know, it's true. But it wasn't true then. So, uh, uh, we worked on a lot of things. Um, one was kind of funny, uh, funny, but there was people. It, the law was in those days that if you complained about your housing, the landlord could uh, ex, uh, kick you out. So, what kind of a democracy is that? Do you get <laughs> so this uh, guy I was working with. His name is Bob Embry. Embry? So, Embry, 
E M B R Y, Bob Embry. He graduated from Harvard Law. And uh, he said, What are we going to do? I said, Well, we might as well write a law prohibiting it. He says, Well, you might as well write it. So this is first year out of law school. I write a piece of legislation called Against Retaliatory Eviction, Evictions. And uh, the, the property owners of Baltimore, which had about 21 members, 20 of which were Jewish, and 18 or 20 or something were from my show, my father's show. So, and we by chance, and we hadn't even realized it. It just happened, and there they were. So they were on the wrong side. From, so I went up to them and spoke to them, and, and they said, well, they're not going to stand as to oppose something that I'm doing, but it's going to be defeated anyway, so they're not worried. So we went to Mayor D'Alessandro. He's uh, the brother of, uh, what's her name? Uh, Speaker of the House? Pelosi. Pelosi. She's from Baltimore, from a, a, a political family. Yeah. She was the sister of the mayor of Baltimore. <laughs> anyway, uh, we got together and he yelled and screamed at me. He said, it's going to ruin my ho his whole career. I said, oh, it's going to make your career. So neither one was right. But uh, he got reelected and the law was passed. Now we had couldn't do retaliatory evictions, but we still had crummy housing. So we created this. Uh, Department of Housing and Community Development for the state of Maryland. And that uh, created money flowing into building a better housing in Baltimore. So for a lot of accomplishment, you know. But it was limited. And uh, there wasn't a, a large movement of support for this yet. Actually, Barbara Murkowski was just beginning. But then I got an offer to uh, ultimately end up in San Francisco doing nationwide work on something called Model Cities. Model Cities was going to show you how the life in the cities could be good, better, and political things. And the president was then Nixon, and he, it was his legislation. So I thought that would be, maybe it would be good. Maybe he could be different than he was. <laughs> I remember my maid. She, she said of, of him, he's a mean man. He's a mean man. And I remember my father came out and said, you know, she's right. He's a mean man. <laughs> anyway, so we, it sounded like something worth doing. And it turned out the, the position in, uh, in San Francisco, I had to wait, and I had to start uh, in, Bal in Washington. So I took the position in Washington. And what I did was go from various cities, teaching them how to create these model cities. It was clear that that was not what they did not intend for it to be anything meaningful, just sort of wedding cake stuff. But it, we didn't have to do it that way. We uh, created a whole program. But I wanted to be in a place where there were young people and Jewish people and so forth. And Washington <clears throat> didn't have a lot going on in the Jewish world, but they had a lot of people and a lot of uh, intelligent people, a whole range of people. And so, um, you know, I had written this thing about new communities, and now they were talking about model cities, although it wasn't real, it was still an idea. So I put them together, and I wanted to do a new community again in reality, and start off with a Jewish core, just because it was easier to do that. Jewish so people. So this was you were living in, in D.C. at this point. Mm -hmm. Had you been involved with or aware of um, Jews for Justice? Yes. Uh, Jews for Justice, uh, I learned about and I went to. But it was very disappointing to me. Um, first of all, people didn't have any idea about 
Jewish stuff. I mean, they were Jewish, but they didn't really know any anything. They didn't have much Jewish learning. No. And they didn't have uh, the Ahavas Yisroel, the love of Israel, meaning the people, that I was accustomed to. But they were full of, some were full of criticism. And, of the Jewish community? Yeah, which I thought was misplaced. So anyway, in the course, I did, so I spent about a year with them. And they also had no religious component. It was, so how would you characterize what JUJ was involved in at that point? It was very political and, uh, and doing the right things on it. Well, sort of, you know, they, they, one of the people who was active in it was sort of the leader in it, I guess. Uh, so the community there had moved the Jewish Community Center from the heart of from the heart of the city to the suburbs. Because it was not safe was one reason that it was done, but also they wanted a new building and do a different thing. So whatever, that wasn't something that interested me, but that's what they wanted to do, so they did. So this guy handed out flyers saying, you're on, wake up, you're on the bus to Auschwitz. <laughs> it's just stupid. And offensive, horribly offensive. So, uh, why? What, why was that the, his message? Why was he? Because he didn't want them moving to the suburbs. The suburbs were all white, and, uh, and so instead of working with the local, what you should have done is worked with the black community and liberal community, and stayed there. But they wanted. They went, they were, you know, it was, just, it was just dumb. It was a very offensive to somebody who had, had, we all had people who were killed and their misuse of the, so that's basically. Then a few other people had the same problem. Uh, and people within JUJ. Yeah, or on the verge of JUJ. And uh, so decided to take a shot and brought in a lot of different people who went through different changes in their life. Arthur Waskow was certainly such a person. Uh, we became close, very close. But this was an example, actually. He did a, a model Seder, to use a term I would have from kids, you know, called the Freedom Seder, yeah. which people thought was great in certain ways. And at first I thought it was wonderful. This was 69, 70. Mm -hmm. But then I read it more carefully, and it was, I thought, not what could be done. The Freedom Haggadah that he wrote mm -hmm. that became used for this mm -hmm. model Seder. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. And we had a lot of wonderful things, but some offensive things. And when I pointed them out to him, and he was, he wanted to learn. And he and I did something called the Shalom Seder. What, what were the kinds of things that you found offensive? Some people were called uh, judge. All, uh, the characters who were involved in the, uh, both in the anti-war and more particularly in black-white relations uh, were all char char figures of who they were perfect. And then the really bad, horrible people were the ones who didn't. And people aren't. They were caricatures. They were caricatures with uh, touches of meanness, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that you didn't feel were accurate, it sounds like, either. Well, nobody's like that. Right. And nor is it accurate, right? It's a mixed reality. So. Yeah, what happened differently when you created the Freedom Satyrs? What, 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 what were the Freedom Satyrs? What were the Freedom Seder? Yeah, I mean they were Haggadot, basically. Oh, the Freedom Seder itself was a was a reality. Right. Yeah, you know, they held it. Um, the first one being on I think the first anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination, the Pesach following that. Uh huh. So I, there was a lot that was good about it, but not enough real Yiddishkeit in it. 
So, you know, it, uh, he changed. And other people came from different other places. Um, and so we wanted to try out this Jewish community business and went to the local UJA and said, we need some money to do this. And no question because of, uh, largely because of my father's reality, the presence, they took it seriously and they gave us $15,000 for the first six months. And who were some of the other people who were involved in, in sort of this early stage of thinking? David Schneer, uh, very much so. One of the things, the big things that he did, he did a lot of things, but one is he brought uh, Shlomo Karlbach to the table. Shlomo I had met in Yale. He was brought down by the Hillel to do something around Lagba Omer. And he got there. By the time he got there, he was supposed to get there at a certain time. He got a couple of hours later, three or four. <clears throat> and it was raining, it was cold, it was miserable. And we started off with a, ten people, maybe. And the, But it, he did it in the courtyard of the uh, residential part of Yale. And he encouraged people to come down. Lights came on, windows opened up. People flowed down, Jewish, non-Jewish, it make a difference. Uh, it was wonderful. And he just kept it up until the sun came out in the next day. Wow. Yeah. Vintage trauma. Vintage, yeah. And so he agreed to uh, come four times to the Fabrengen in a couple month period as a help us get started. And David put together a band Fed, uh, for Brandon Fiddlers. Right. So, uh, and we had, there were other people. So, and Arthur, Arthur was a big part. Arthur Waska. Paul Rutke? Mm hmm. Yeah. That's Paul Rutke. That is. He did that. Though. It's a, uh, was used as a um, advertisement for to get people to come to Fabrangen and it has all the events that took place there. It's a, it's a poster. Poster, it's wow. a poster, yeah. Mm -hmm. A different, um, with, what do they call that again? I don't remember, a type of... Like a lithograph or something like that? Something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, he was, he was an interesting guy. He is an interesting guy. He, uh, working, he did work in the space area, but also in the Pentagon. Who are we talking about now? Paul. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then he got involved in Fabrengen, and, and his whole life changed. And uh, this was his effort to move it, help move people to so art and culture were part of the religious experience. The sad thing is he uh, married a young lady a few years after this, and she had many children. They became very orthodox. And. Uh, she was sick, and the doctor said, you cannot have any more children. She said, I'll do what the rabbi says I should do, the rabbi says. And he, he said, you have to have whatever God does is going to be for good. She had a, another child, and she died. Anyway, he, he went into art yeah. stuff. He did that. So you, you um, were involved in writing a concept paper. That's mm -hmm. what you started to describe before, right? Mm -hmm. um, I wrote it, yeah. You wrote it. Um, can you uh, sort of flesh out a little bit what your thinking was, what you were trying to express in the concept? Well, we were trying to to get people to think of religion as Judaism is a total way of life, not just a prayer here or there, but a whole cultural experience. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and from a religious point of view, that again, the Midrashic core of Judaism is as important as the halachic <coughs> external and that we move in both directions. Um, and so that people, we set up a, 
a, class, a you know, series of classes. So for the first time, people really, as adults, were approaching Jewish life and uh, took it very seriously. You're talking about once for writing in? Well, right yeah, once we... Okay, we, so we, this paper was circulated, is that what happened in the, sort of, in the community? Mm -hmm. And to UJA? Yeah, and the UJA, I mean, this was, they took a real shot in the dark. I mean, you know, they, they, you know right. they knew what Agus, but they didn't know me. And, and then, so what did they decide to do? They gave us $15,000, and that was for six months with a clear understanding that we could get more. And then we needed a building. <clears throat> so it's on Florida Avenue, 2158 Florida. And right that was owned right by, on yeah, by On the Poster. And that building was uh, used by uh, Roman Catholic Sisters. That's where they had lived for a while for their mission. It was really in the heart of DuPont Circle, which was the center of creative cultural life. And uh, they were so happy to be doing this. You know, they thought it was thrilling that we were making use of this facility. It was a perfect facility for us. So that was great. But there were people who opposed uh, for bringing once they found out what it was. Can you go back and just talk for a minute about the name, the choice of the name yeah. uh, for Brengen before we move forward? So, first yeah. place, what does for Brengen mean? It means coming together in Yiddish. In Yiddish. So, why that? Well, one thing with clearly I'm, we're community. And community and for Brengen are the same thing in a sense. For Brengen, though, makes you smile. That's true. And instead of a chavara, a chavara, one of the things about them that is important is that it's focused on particular people, and it's limited. And, and by that, I mean, by chavara at that point, we're talking about 1970, 71, right? Mm -hmm. They were basically the New York chavara, which had been founded in 69, mm -hmm. and chavara Shalom, which had been founded in 68. Right. So those were the two models that were yes. out there, essentially. Right. And I thought they were too exclusive. They were membership organizations. Yeah. And they only let certain people become members. Not everybody could become a member. Which was, you know, well, okay. But it didn't have the chance of being the core for a, a major thing. And also they were a little bit too uh, narrowly Jewish on certain things, from my perspective. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Before we get off the word for Brengen. Yeah, and it's also the name for the Yiddish, uh, Yiddish, in Yiddish, for the gatherings that the Lubavitch did. The, the Rebbe had a number of far Brengens. <laughs> you saw that in the. Yeah. yeah, we had to come up with a name quickly, uh, and it, it, w it was a real thing, so it was a 501c3 corporation, and you had to get the papers and so forth. And in those days, it wasn't as easy to get it as it was. Then, say that again. In we we it it was not as easy to get a five hundred one c three status that was anti government, uh, as because Nixon was you know in charge of such things. So we met Sheldon Cohen was his name. He had been the immediate past head of the IRS. He got us that. Yeah. Even though for him it took a couple of months of effort and so on. So and the spelling of and the spelling, we lost the R because I, ha I called my mother from the downtown, you know, and said, can you spell Varbring and whatever? And I thought she said F-A without the R. F-A-B. F-A-B. But it was incorrect. But it really wasn't incorrect because what we were saying, we were going to do all this without relying on a Rebbe. There was no race in the name in that sense. And it means coming together, and it sounds good in English and in Yiddish. And it was not a chavara. I didn't, I didn't like the concept of the chavara as the only alternative. And the concept that you were objecting to had to do with the, the sort of exclusivity. Yes. That, that was the point. Um, okay. uh, another cousin of mine wanted to be a member of the group 
mainly to avoid the draft, and they didn't allow it. They were rejected. Yeah, it's an issue for them. Yeah. Um, so who did the Ferengan intend to reach? Who was your sort of target audience? Everybody. Everybody and anybody? Everybody. Everybody. We had non-Jews, a few non-Jews. They were not members. That was one rule that we had. You had to be Jewish to well, What did membership mean? It didn't mean context? much. It means you could come to, the, to all the events for free. It's also the free community or something like that. Toward uh, creating a Jewish counterculture. For, Jew, for Brandon Jewish Free Culture Center. Yeah. So the idea there was to that the programs that we gave were as important as the learning and all of that was as as important as the political. Well it all came together. What about the religion? For Brandon Jewish Free Culture Center. So, everything has a bit of a compromise to it. And we didn't want to get into an issue of whether this is conservative or this is this. Names that meant nothing to 90% of the young people in D.C. at the time. I had no interest in whether it was reform or whether it was conservative one or two or three or four. Didn't care. They wanted a place where they could express themselves and their feelings and their mind could come together to change some reality. So that's why it was, we didn't want to get into that, and we didn't have to get into that. Um, and we had all types. Describe some of the types. Some of the people were whacked out of their mind from drugs and things like that. And uh, we agreed to uh, try to reach them and you know, would not have been to say there's no such thing as drugs. It would be a thing that you have to make intelligent use of such things. And it's not necessary for experience of God to have drugs. In fact, it's counter to that. But you do what you do. But our role was to provide medical help uh, as well as cultural help. So this was part of the activism, essentially, mm -hmm. of her pregnancy. Mm -hmm. What, what were some of the initial kinds of activities that Verbrengen sort of initiated in those first six months? Yeah, so we did set up a, a clinic, if you want to call it that, that but where people came with their problems, and their problems could be financial, they could be uh, army uh, draft counseling. So draft counseling. Yeah, and drug counseling. And Was there, were there people with any particular expertise who staffed these? Yes. With the, we worked with the um, Jewish, whatever it's called, social services, JESA, it's called Jewish Social, social Service Agency. <laughs> yeah, they had a person who was young and with it and so forth, but aware of the problems. And uh, of course, Jewish education was a big part of it. And uh, we had real people on that as well. My father gave a whole series of lectures about Martin Buber. He wrote; the, he was the first person to write about Martin Buber. Was that were those classes or more public sort of lecture type things? Lecture kind of thing with a subgroup that would discuss who wanted to in greater detail, taking from the college that you have a lecture and then you have. A study group or whatever. Discussion section, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. And uh, people loved it. Um, a lot of education courses. Um, and a lot of it, emphasis on music and or the arts in general. Right from the beginning. Yeah. What did that mean in practical terms, emphasis on the arts, right, in those first months? Somebody who had all this stuff in his heart, hadn't yet learned how to do it. Mm -hmm. We helped find somebody, and uh, he took off. But he was not the only person. You know, David Schneer uh, had the same experience. Music. And music. Yep. And davening. Mm -hmm. And our, our davening was uh, similar to Chavarat Shalom. So we'll get in, I want to get into that in, in some depth um, shortly, but the first service was 
in February of 71, I think. Were you at that service? For Brangen was me. It was you. So you were definitely there. Yeah. What do you remember about that first Oh, it was service? great. It was all these people who had limited Jewish experience, or a lot of Jewish experience, but it wasn't open, it wasn't a liberating experience. This was liberating people, you know, sing and dance. And, uh, and I insisted on explaining what the words were. It wasn't just... Uh, and then it meant more di different things to different people. And I found myself... To that very first? All kinds of people. You know, overwhelmingly Jewish, and and women. Women could participate from the beginning, no question about it. So right from the beginning. Right from the beginning. Non-Jewish people, if they had an interest in becoming Jewish, which they did. People came, yeah. And I mean, people came who had never been to a service or never been to one that they found meaningful. Sounds like you were tapping into a real thirst. Yeah. It was out there. Yeah. Yeah. And this and the people who were doing it were doing it for themselves. So that there wasn't, you know, a class of of people. There were people maybe who had the ability to provide certain things that other people couldn't. But they didn't see themselves as it was as being this controlling force. They saw it as opening force. Yeah. Um, so let's go back and just look at the context a little bit more closely. Um, how would you describe the relationship between Verbrungen and J.U.J. Um, and both of them and the Jewish establishment, the sort of the larger Jewish world at the very beginning? So uh, J.U.J had about 10 members or something. It was not a large or tiny. tiny. And secondly, as I say, I think it had some very good ideas. Some people did. Some were much too critical of the Jewish community in general. We're having a war against, from my point of view, we're not having a war against the Jews. They were funding us. <laughs> Because they wanted to, nobody was making them. You know, it was a big effort. Uh, and people are people, and if you talk to them as people and not as things, uh, you can make a lot of progress. So we did. And some of the people in the UJA on the staff, I remember them, came from a background of being very activist, socialist types, Jewish social, you know. So. And you could see them sitting there. They came to, they stopped coming just as staff of the UJA. They came out of love of Yiddishkeit and wanting to express their soul. You, you saw them sitting on the floor, which we also all sat on the floor, you know. I got that from the Chavara. Uh And they were there on the floor. These guys were in their 50s and 60s. And they had smiles a mile wide. Uh, and everybody saw it. it it's like they were the, being moved, certainly personally. Yeah, it sounds like. yeah. All all types, from the wealthy main givers to the staff. No opposition. Now there were some. There were a couple of people who were very powerful within the Jewish community, who opposed it, and they opposed it on the grounds that Arthur and people like that were involved in it. And what was their objection? Oh, they're just doing that. We were just doing this. I, I'm a, a naive young man, a wonderful person, comes from a good family, but I'm wrong. But uh, others are evil. They're, they're trying to capture my mind and the mind of other people. It was so wrong that even if I hadn't cared about it, I would have fought. <laughs> but it was just wrong. It was just wrong. So, uh, but they never gave in. The, the other two or three people who opposed it were right-wing Zionists, to the extent they were Zionists. Or had, and this is, as they were, you think they started out opposing it, or...? Oh yeah, they opposed it from the beginning. From the beginning. Okay. 
Um, but the, there were enough people who cared about me personally and the, the, this whole world out there that they were willing to try something. Right. Some young people with money. And, uh, Michael Staub um, writes in Torn at the Roots uh, that most people at the time accepted the idea that Verbrengen was the non-political arm of J.U.J. Um, and others felt that J.U.J. basically had become Verbrengen. J.J., as they say, was a very small group. <laughs> That's one thing I saw right off the bat. And so there were some people, well, everybody's a variety of things. So as I say, there were some, some stuff they did which was just silly or dumb or offensive. And a couple of people were promoting that. They, they actually became members of Verbrengen, but they didn't fit in. Do you think that the UJA money, uh, as you look back on it, came with real strings attached? I didn't. You didn't? No. I told them, if you, have a, if you want to see what's going on, come and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and were there internal tensions within Fabrengen about um, the place of political activism in the community? Yeah, it was a very active place, <laughs> with people uh, given not freedom to do what they want. So uh, there were, you know, there was a lot of the people who came uh, didn't have negative views about the people that they disagreed with. They just disagreed with them. Nishkafilch, but. Uh, the other, but there were, as I say, a few people, but a powerful few people. Mm -hmm. um, they so were wrong too. They they thought that a couple particular people were running the place. Those people were not running the place. If anybody was running the place, it was me. Right. There was so neither. there were others. Th those and there were attempts, as I understand it, to limit the roles of certain key people. Yeah, that's what you're talking about. And I told them that's not going to happen. So, why and how did the, did the Federation decide to cut off the funding after the first six months? They were afraid... What happened there? Well, it, it was six months, so we had to go through the... So there were, there were some opposition, mainly people uninformed, but some informed, they just disagreed. Uh, and the UJA is in the business of raising money, not losing money. So they were afraid they might lose some money. Even though by now we had some wealthy people who, in the, who were in the community who came and saw and, and heard. What do you mean they were afraid they might lose the money? Might that lose people, those donors? Yeah. So uh, they set up a committee to look into it and decide what's happening. The committee came back with glowing Terms. Nobody. These guys were stu stu studgy. <laughs> they. Knew, it was like they were reborn. You know, I was afraid they were going to have a heart attack. <laughs> they loved it. They set up an evening when people came, and about fifty people came from Verbrengen in a broad sense. Each one told a story more moving than the next. It was really something to see. So they recommended the funding continue. But money talks, and a couple, and the fear of losing it was a mistake. On there. Um, it was a big mistake, and it really stopped it to some degree. Why, why did the Federation accuse Fabrengen of being anti-Israel, essentially? And what role did that have in the decisions, the ultimate decision yeah. to hold the funding? Well, it, it's the same people, and. Uh, they made up a whole thing about it. Well, first of all, that was when Palestinians and Jews were beginning to talk to each other in Israel. And some of those people came back from their experience in Israel and said, hey, you had this, why can't you do it? But there were no Palestinians in Washington <laughs> at that time in any case. 
So this is what this is what where opposition is most aware, most possible. And there were people who were on the margin now, you know. But that you have to have. If, you, if you're trying to build something that goes with, that's true to truth. Truth is expensive, not closed, and you're going to have some people that you don't agree with. So. But at the beginning, and they kept our, their support. Actually, were rabbis uh, such as the rabbi of Addis Israel and Washington Hebrew, the two big conservative and reform. They were in favor. They were in favor of continuing the support. Where did this inflammatory article come from that appeared in the Jewish Week? We never got to know. We don't know. They made up the name. They made up what name? The name of the article, the by such and such. Oh, you mean who, whoever supposedly wrote yeah. the, the journalists? Who right. Wrote. Whoever they were. I don't know. They were journalists or not journalists, but. Most likely there were people connected to the Jewish Community Council. He was the, the head of that, who was a guy who, and this is, was sad, he uh, was very Jewishly involved. And he's the head of the, and uh, done a lot of good things. But he was losing his position. He was like Mr. Social Action. Well, they weren't really doing that much in social action. Nothing like what we were doing. And he was afraid of losing his status, you know, whatever. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And he knew how to get to the people who were running things. As it was, it came down to the line, too. You know. How so? This event that I described brought a lot of support. And uh, and actually, what they that they said was, you know, any new money I'd have to agree to remain as the director of it. You'd have to agree to what? Be remain as the director. You'd have to. Agree yeah, to. I'd have to do it. right. And this was already a lot of effort, and uh, all the forces were you know, working on me. And, so. and you were opposed to there being a, a Rebbe figure, a central figure, in yeah. sense, it sounds like. Right. So, I didn't want to do that. I was afraid of it would become too much me. And, but in addition, it was so wrong, it was just wrong. You know, uh, not a lot of money would have allowed us to continue. The sisters were so sorry. That they, <laughs> I thought they were going to testify, which worried me, of course, because one of the things is we were going to, weren't being Jewish, you know. So as a result, you did have to leave that building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We moved to another place, uh, and then another place. And, so, what, what would you say was the impact um, on, the, on the community and the directions it took moving forward as all of this was unfolding and Ferengen nerves were processing what was happening? Well, so there was all this energy wasted on the, these issues. And uh, they, weren't, they weren't real, and if they had been real anyway, they were very small. And there are all kinds of people who are involved, and, you know. But we wasted, we had to waste all this time, and, time and energy. And also, you know, in distant people don't like each other; it spreads like a plague. As it was, we continued, and for bringing is still in existence, and still has, you know, for high holidays we. We were faced with what to do about the high holidays way back. And I said, well, let's go with it. Well, whatever the people want to come, we'll find room for them. And we had first time 100 people, then 200 people, then 500 people. Churches. And they still get to around 300, 400 people. 
There's no question it doesn't have the dynamism that it had. But it did for a while. So let's let's sort of delve into some of the key components of it as it was sort of moving into this next phase, which is what really became for Bring It, right? Um, uh, so many people point to community as the heart of the Chavara endeavor. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, as we've been saying, definitions of the ideal community differed among these first three early Chavara. So, how would you describe for bringing this notion of community? What, what were you trying to create? Well, we were trying to create a place that would help people as individuals feel, as I've said before, I'm, it's me speaking here, because not everybody was quote-unquote religious who came. Mm-hmm. But in my mind, that's what... Uh, it's a, Judaism is a religious culture. Otherwise, it's not real. It's fine, but it's not. And we made it clear that that's what we, the leadership felt with. Including people who had come back to something they hadn't been in for 30 years, you know. It wasn't just young people. There were a lot of young people, but it wasn't just young people by any means. And, and at the same time, everything else can be made to be more than it is um, because of the core. So we were, you know, we had classes and everything, and uh, yeah. um, we so set up the Summer Institute. We got a hundred people. The study institute kind yeah, of thing? for the summer. Right in the beginning, right from the beginning. Yeah. And no, uh, that would be June, July, you know, August, after February. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it would after we've already been told that we're not going to be refunded. So, I mean, they didn't kill the organization. In fact, uh, some of the best stuff was after. Right, right. Um, can you just describe, so, so the community moved from this place on uh, Florida Avenue to uh, 21st Street. Mm-hmm. Can you just describe it? Describe this place. What what did it look like? What was the feel of it? Which place? The second. This, so this is now you're moving into mm-hmm, your new home mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It the main thing that it, it didn't have was as much space as the other one had. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, it was very similar. It had a, uh, a an area that outside over a garage, which could be you know this ugly thing, but it was actually quite nice. And people were always doing nice things to improve the environment. Uh, and it was, you know, we, we, you know, so for example, in the, when, in the, when we had the building on Florida, I could cook Shabbos meals. This is the evil, you know, I'm actually creating meals. That's what the people wanted, that's what they wanted, Shabbos meals. So we did. We did Shabbos meal. And in the new place? We had a kitchen, but it was nowhere near the size or the niceness. The building was fine, it, but it was. What did it, it look like? And what was the? Can you describe it, the aesthetics? It, it looked like the area generally has row houses, townhouses actually. So it had an in, inside it had several rooms, and then it had this outside area on top of this big garage. So, it was nice. And in terms of the the furnishings and the just the general decor and ambiance, what was it like? It didn't have much, but it was. It didn't matter because it was so full of people all the time that, uh, you know. The first building we had people live there. David lived there, which made it nice. It didn't have that, but it didn't didn't affect much. We always were crowded, which is a plus and a minus. <laughs> yes, yes. And we quickly realized that uh, in those days we had uh, services also happened in the Religious Action Center of the Reform Movement, had a building on Massachusetts Avenue nearby. And the head of that organization was uh, David Saperstein, was his name. He was very, very supportive. He himself was not into 
but he was very supportive. Mm -hmm. um, so outside of classes and religious services, which we're going to come back to in, in more detail, were there regular occasions when the community came together, for instance, for meals, uh, communal meals or, and meetings? Well, meals we had for Shabbos or other such events. People brought. They were potluck mm -hmm. in that sense? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and where would the meal take place? Uh, in the space in the building, you know, you make do. It was no problem. Um, what was your? Uh, were there were there um, general there re agreed upon policies around let's say kashrut or what 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 people could bring or not bring? Yes, but they were. If, uh, more open than would, if it were a conservative shul, everything would have to have a UO on it or something like that. We didn't require that. It's that it wasn't, didn't have any chazer in it or whatever it is, you know. It was kosher, right. but it wasn't a challenge to be. Right. You weren't looking for particular hectares or anything like that? No. no. So people could bring cheese? Whatever they want. It was dairy? Or could they bring meat? Meat for the public meeting? Uh, yeah, public meals. Uh, uh, yeah, it was basically dairy, although we tried to do the Shabbos like a Shabbos, because I find that meaningful in itself. So which Shabbos meals would happen communally? Friday night. Friday night. Uh -huh. Saturday, was, now Saturday was an interesting thing from the beginning. This Paul... Uh, had set up a Shabbos morning study session. And what it consisted of was reading the Parsha of the week, word by word, and comments word by vow. Very, very detailed, and very, very long. About three hours, <laughs> or so, or more, you know. And, uh, and who would lead this? They would take themselves, and then when I showed up on the scene, it was everybody and me. Yeah. <laughs> and I usually went to the show in Georgetown before I'd go to an Orthodox, an Orthodox show, for a Shabbos service, and then I'd walk over to where they were, which was in his apartment, and for hours. So this study session took place in his apartment rather than in the Forbrengen? Well, it, Forbrengen didn't exist. So when we created Forbrengen, this is a piece of it that we just brought over. So the, the davening and the communal thing at its height was a Friday night thing. And there was the study group which grew. So they both grew. At first, the first couple of years, the Friday night thing was the main gathering point. For the community? Yeah. And there wasn't much, as much Torah studies, but then when we combined the two, so they both... Right. So what was the feel of those Friday night gatherings? Oh, they were great. Tell me about them. The very uh, emotional, energetic, open. Singing? A lot of singing? Yeah. We had a, the Fabringen fiddlers that David put together were played at these events, and you know it was just great. It was uh, Shlomo Karbach I mentioned came set four times, and he he loved it. He, he said this was the greatest. It was very meaningful and touching kind of thing. Had you ever been in an environment really like that before? Well, that's why I called uh, the kosher kitchen it wasn't a, mm -hmm. in its own way, but in its own way it was. Yeah. yeah. And but that yeah, it was limited college kids and so for adults this was really something. Yeah. 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 I did uh, get a lot of concept from the Chavrat Shalom. They were, they were open to, uh, in a sense, I could go all the time there. 
and be treated as a quasi member. Yeah. On Shabbat mornings. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you, and we could see how things could happen, you know. Right. Did people, um, did, did Fabrengan become a, a, an inviting community the way oh, yeah. Kavrat Shalom did, where people invited other members and members of the community to their own homes for other, other Shabbos or holiday meals? Yeah, it became the community that we thought it would be in that sense, yeah. Yeah. I guess what I'm asking here is, was that piece an important part of it yes. becoming an inviting community as yes, well? Yes, very much so, yeah. Okay. So how did that happen? I mean, not everybody liked every part. The community meetings, which were held every so often, mm -hmm. uh, were uh, often quite emotional. Let's talk about the role of community meetings in working out communal issues and policies. So how often did they happen to start with? Well, in the beginning, they happened a lot. <laughs> might be every day, might, an issue uh, might come up, you know. And so there would be like an informal meeting. Right. Was it ever institutionalized? Like oh, yeah. We, we had it on a regular basis. I don't remember now, monthly or weekly. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the sort of major issues or themes that would be there, discussed in these meetings? Well, uh, what should the davening consist of? I mean, generally left open considerably, but still. Were there certain things that should be required? Such as? A certain amount of serv uh, the Amida is the Amida, you know, I mean, there are certain... So pieces of the traditional literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And other stuff, non-traditional, but not that much, not crazy, you know, people didn't dance around nude or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> and of course, that women could participate in everything. Did, did participate. Not only could, but did. Uh, we started the uh, classes specifically to help them catch up, so to speak, uh, about mitzvah. You know, that kind of thing. So these things would be discussed at yeah. the communal meetings. Yeah. So why why did they get to be so emotionally heated? Well, everything. Talks about. Yeah, I don't know. Every 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 issue was <laughs> it seemed like an issue. Well, because we were saying that everybody had to contribute or could could, could contribute, so people did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people have different uh, psychological makeups too. So people who don't like that, don't want that in their shovel, so to speak. Was there but also there's person? politics. Hmm? Excuse me? There's also some concern over politics. Should some people be prohibited from coming, or vice versa? For instance? That they were, too, they were maybe pro-Vietnam War, we wouldn't keep somebody out, but that they may feel they weren't welcome. It's not the truth. You know, you'll see when you meet George, I mean. Mm -hmm. But, um... What, uh, was it, what was the issue around that? That someone... Are you saying that the group would become aware that someone, for instance, was pro-Vietnam War? They would was, not be comfortable. They would not be comfortable. The person, him or herself. But what about the group? What in the what group? Way would the it group. Come up the as group. Part of a group, group wouldn't. Well, it would come up because it comes up. Somebody raised the issue, so it has to be discussed. But I mean, by and large, people would know that you may have been in the war, but you didn't run the war. We didn't have cap with you know military people. Like there, there were a couple people with serious uh, army experience, but they had given it up. So I wouldn't say it'd be, it, was, it would be a place that you would not be comfortable if you really thought the North Vietnamese should be killed, something like that. It certainly would be if you manifested some dislike of black people or 
So were the discussions that took place in these communal meetings... They were not about these things, but those things were, might affect your view of somebody. And it may take several occasions before it comes out what that concern is. Right. Yeah. But I don't think that was a big... Thing, but I'll admit now I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, so was there a basic principle that decisions were made essentially by consensus? Yes. Was, was there um, a form of leadership in these meetings? How did, how did the group arrive at consensus? Well, they talked. Talked and they talked and they talked and they talked. And eventually, typically, you would arrive at consensus? We would arrive, yeah. Mm -hmm. But a lot of effort. Some, for some things, a lot of things wouldn't matter. Although, let's say there was some person who suddenly appears and is questionable. You know, does he really care? He's, is he really a person sent by the other side of the Jewish community? Right. If there were, there were minuscule numbers of people. Yeah, so those weren't issues that were taking... They away. become an issue because, ah, uh, how can you... S they say you won't keep anybody out, and nobody was kept out. But they may not have felt wanted. Well, right. that's a true feeling. So there was some self-selection. Yeah, but not much. Mm -hmm. um, did the emotional intensity of these meetings affect you personally? How did you deal with it? Uh, it, it did not make me happy. <laughs> but life goes on. Uh, sometimes worse than others, you know. And the and the other the other thing is is very really personal is that I got married to my first wife in March or so I don't remember exactly and her mother had uh, a heart problem a serious heart problem so she had to go visit her. She, her family lived in, was now living in Israel, her father and mother, but the mother needed more care than that. <clears throat> so either I was doing business or she was taking care of her mother. And it just made for it not possible. Yeah. So. so there was your own emotional life you were right. as well. Right, so. right. You know, people were supportive. But it's one thing. There was one woman who came to the community as a non-Jew and wanted to be treated as Jewish, that she was, because she wanted to be Jewish. And this was discussed, and there were a group of people who were in favor of that. There was no need to be half a category called Jewish, or the Christian, or anything. Whatever you want to be, you can be. And it shouldn't be a factor in decision making. So there were people who had that position, and she had that position. Um, and we made it clear that we were happy to convert her. To actually go through a conversion process. Yeah, which, which was, was not a, what she'd been proposing. She thought she didn't need to. So how had that decision been arrived at? The decision to... The community discussed it more than once. And she, she, was, she was a very nice person and everything. So, I mean, ultimately he said we'd be glad to, you know, do this. Uh, you won't get acceptance elsewhere, perhaps, outside here certainly in certain parts of the world. So the actual details we would work out. So what we ended up doing is she went through a process with, uh, I don't remember, I think an Orthodox rabbi or something, and we incorporated that in a larger thing that more people came to. 
and everybody was satisfied. So in the end, she did con formally convert. She did, yeah. By halachic standards as well. Yeah. 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 That sounds like an, an instance where it worked to everybody. Yeah, it would satisfaction. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, there were probably some people who weren't happy with the final decision. Because they agreed with her that she shouldn't? Either they agreed or they didn't, you know, everybody has different. She says, the yeah. community, yeah. there are many right. divergent opinions. But she, no, she was uh, happy. I don't remember really what happened to her. Um, um, I, I think, I'm pretty sure she married a Jewish guy and she moved away, so that's why I don't know. Yeah. At some point, she well, she was there, and she was a good dancer, so she taught people. You know, she added to the value. Yeah. Obviously, if you do that, you're going to have an easier time of it. Right. Yeah, but she she was fine. Some observers have pointed to an increased focus on prayer um, and study as opposed to political activism as one of the outcomes of UJA's decision to cut off funding after the first six months. Can you describe what you think the, the sort of attitude towards tefillah was within the community as a whole? It was... In Fabregen, sort of as it, as it evolved <coughs> over those early years, after the first six months. Uh -huh. um, so whether there was an increase or... Yeah, or just... Where, where, where did it figure in people's, um, what they were looking for from this community? Uh -huh. and, and then I have some more questions about it, uh -huh. about tefillah and, and service more specifically. Services in general? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Well, you know, first of all, I'm not a member anymore. Right. No, I mean, we're so, talking about the 70s. The okay, early 70s. okay. <clears throat> so, the early 70s was a, a period when it was being developed. Exactly. Right. And I don't know exactly when one would say that doesn't happen so much anymore. But Would, would you say, for instance, <clears throat> um, that if you looked sort of across the membership, and people who would come on a regular basis in that early period. Where would you put yourself in terms of um, the importance of tefillah in your own life and uh, the role, the sort of the religious piece of what was going on and what you were trying to create within this community relative to other people? Uh -huh. Well, I could be wrong. Shocking though that may be, <laughs> but um, I would think that people who were active in the early, early-ish days were very much into tefillah. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're at the point of learning about it. It's not automatic, but I, it's, it's a pretty um, established community by now. What do you mean by, by now? Well, in the beginning there were a lot of people there who didn't have much experience right. and or interest. Although they had interest, they wouldn't be there if they didn't have it. Right. By and large, yeah. And now I would guess it's even more because most of the other stuff is limited now, meaning 2016, yeah. in the recent, recent years. A little yeah. whatever. Um, what, can you give us an overview of what were Shabbat services like on Shabbat morning at Fabrengen in, in those early years? Just paint, paint the first place, where were people? Were they, where were they sitting? What was the room arranged like? What, what, what were the essential components of tefillah? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Tefillah had become, after the, the end of the money and the other building, <clears throat> basically it occurred at the Religious Action Center of the Reform Movement. So what that meant is they have a conference room, they had a conference room, 
uh, that was fairly large. And we would come in there and rearrange the furniture, which was a big deal. Because, you know, a lot of people come and leave, manage to avoid <laughs> the work related to it. <clears throat> anyway, so that's created, that would create enough space. There weren't chairs, so there were cushions. That's similar to the cover. When you said rearrange the space, in a, in a conference room, was there a big table there? Uh -huh. In the middle? Yeah, now, did we rely on the... I think we moved that because it took up too much space and had another table or something. But and could, people were sitting where? People were sitting around, facing the whatever the Aron was. Sitting on what? <clears throat> Cushions. On the floor? Yeah. Okay, so the, you took the chairs were removed pretty much? They were certainly in the early days. I don't remember now. Yeah, yeah. okay. So sitting around, facing... Yeah. In a circle, sort of facing the aroma. Yeah, the, yeah. And what was the what what was the aroma? What did it? What was it made of? Well, there is one now. It's been around a long time. I don't know how long. And what is it made of? Wood. I don't think for the first number of years there was. In the first number of years, the no. I think we had. Well. That's a little unusual space because the Torah was given to President Kennedy and then loaned, quote unquote, to the Religious Action Committee. Or, and they have a, a room. Whether we use that, we must have used it. Do you remember, Jenna? No, I don't, I don't remember. Okay. But um, they have a, a, a room now. Yeah. Okay. Um, just one small thing. If you can avoid as much as possible moving your hands to your face, because I don't want any shadows on your face. Keep them glued. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, many people... Uh, have described services at Chavarat Shalom as neo-Hasidic. Do you think that term also applies? It services? applies probably not as constantly as theirs is. Uh -huh. Were there um, ideas and practices <coughs> drawn from the Jewish mystical tradition that were pretty much integrated into the Fabregno program? Well, uh, I, I wouldn't say that there was neo-Hasidic except for the melodies. Which were a big part. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's been a long time since I've been to Kavarat Shalom. So they had cushions and the, yeah. Yeah, somewhat similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not as ideological on that point because the leadership is more focused on neo Hasidic stuff, I guess. There, yeah. Yeah. Shalom. yeah. <clears throat> Did the did a Shabbat service follow a pretty traditional um, liturgy? With one exception, which is, and this was not when I was well. It, it was a point of my thinking. This was not for me. Um, they eliminated. Uh, well, there are two reasons. Musaf was eliminated. That was early on. <clears throat> by, by virtue of a communal consensus? Mm -hmm. The feeling being uh, Esther Tickton is the one who pushed this, that our group doesn't daven every day. So if you, you uh, don't... So the Musaf is an additional day. So it would be running counter to the practice that we're otherwise doing. I think that's quote unquote silly. <laughs> but you may not want to do it for other reasons. You know, it takes up a lot of time. You've already put up, there's, the time spent on the Torah service is much greater than normal. 
because of that discussion stuff that I talked yeah, about. I mean, I don't do the same thing anymore, but it's still more time on that than you would think. Yeah. Right. So Musaf was one thing that's yeah. not that is a departure from right. a traditional liturgy. You right. said there are a couple of things. Well, I, the beginning uh, was left to the chazan as to how much of the morning shachar stuff that you want to do, the blessings. Like the and, yeah, yeah, probably would do one or two, three, but not a whole 20 minute, 20 pages or whatever. Right. So that was another thing. But otherwise it was fairly traditional, you're saying, yeah. in terms of the patterns. Well, many people have also pointed to the creative tension between tradition and innovation in Chavurah style um, uh, services. Was that true at Verbringen as well? Yeah. So can you describe some of the innovation Well, features? so I've done the elimination of the Musaf, with the exception of uh, Yontif. Um, and Suket uh, Zimra, that kind of thing also. You know, you could say on the one hand, it's not a big deal, it's not a big deal. It's, I don't think the Sukkot is certainly not a big deal. Um, but if you were accustomed to doing it, it's a big deal. I don't know. There were a lot, there were a lot of discussions on the Musaf issue. Uh, I don't think there were any on the Sukkot is or something like that. Mm-hmm. And that was a number of years ago, really. Do you remember... Uh, any experimentation that had to do with um, body movement, for instance? Yeah, there was a period when people were more into that. What was that? Because they, cause they were kind of people who were engaged in body movement. So what kinds of things would they, uh, they might, experiment with? Yeah. The, uh, we include or not include, or yeah. methodology? Either. Well, I, um, I, don't, I don't think there was much attention paid. paid to By the time you got to a lot of singing and a long Torah discussion and maybe some other discussion. So those were the big innovations that yeah. you're saying. Big, lots of emphasis on music yeah. and big Torah discussion. Um, so explain what the role of the tour discussion was in a, in a Fabrengan service. So, well, I, was a, I think I didn't get to where I was started on that, which is with Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Paul so they, they used to spend two or three hours. I mentioned that on tour. So that was... Before the in, service. That was before... That service. was the service. That was the service. pre Fabrengan. So when Fabrengan came around, we incorporated that into a service concept as well. But still, it was lengthy. So every year, for a number of years, we would cut some. <laughs> you know, the ability to cut would increase. Not each year you'd do it gently so that the people didn't really... How, how long was it when it started? And, I mean, what's, what, what amounts of time? Oh, these were, it could be three-hour discussions. In the middle of a service, actually? Yeah. And then it became... Each word. Each word. Mm-hmm. It's kind of funny when you think back on it because it's very religious, quote unquote, in a Jewish sense. Study. Yeah. And who would would, would someone lead that discussion? How did they? No, uh, they only lead it in the sense of move it along. Otherwise, it'd be even longer. <laughs> so, did that change at all? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So how? I mean, how would it change? How did it? Change? Do they just eliminate? How how much would be? Would it be? word by word of the Parsha, the whole Parsha, or would it be at least a page, or, or then the traditional uh, Aaliyah amount, something like that. Mm-hmm. Did people experiment with doing things like bringing contemporary issues in and trying to relate it to yeah. the Parsha? Yeah. And that's left up to the individual. So it, it's easier, in a certain sense, just to go right along. But if you're interested in how it relates to issues of the day, so that's up to whoever is. I don't think you would establish that it's required. It was an option.
But did it happen frequently? Well, in the beginning, yeah. As I say, uh, and then things were sort of the same every like like most places. A certain amount of sukkah is immersed. A certain amount given to the Torah reading. It's not a triennial or anything like that. It's just you know, move along. And so did you did was the Torah read on the triennial cycle or the full cycle or how did how did that work? As much as you could stand in the beginning, <laughs> and now there must be a system, probably the triennial. But your memories of those early years was the, the early years were more exciting to somebody like me who otherwise goes to a place that just reads. I find the laning, just the pure laning, to be not so exciting. Mm -hmm. But in a big show with a lot of people, it doesn't work to have discussion on every word, that's for sure. But Maybe. you found it exciting when it was happening. Well, those were small groups and the people were all <laughs> excited and seeing Motivated. The, yeah, yeah. 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 And see it as a way for them to learn their Jewish, Yiddish kite. And, it was the it was the davani of the day, and then when that was and and another thing different from over the time shows that things evolve, is in the beginning it was Friday morning Friday evening that was the key service not Saturday, and my guess, my guess well it did change when the uh, Tictons came, it was easier to add the Torah service. Then, but she still wanted to keep the uh, not doing Musaf. Why was it easier to add the Torah service when the Tiktons came? Simply because, you know, another expert saying we could do this or do that. Okay. So there were some more authoritative voices like that. Yeah, Tiktons yeah, yeah. It's, it's not formal. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. Now, these were discussed by the com community as a whole. And then it was a chance for women to, right. who didn't have much knowledge to lead the opening and closing of the Aron. Right. But I want to go back to what you just said, because I don't think we've made that clear so far. And that is that in the very early periods, it was Friday night services. Yeah. So more, it was a Kabbalah Shabbat service, yeah. essentially. Yes. And then there we were very creative in the beginning. Uh, that you, instead of just doing the Kabbalah Shabbat that's presented to us, you could do something else. And there was a time when, what happened to you on Monday? What happened to you on Tuesday? Think about it. Tell us about it. Or if you needed more organization, organize it around the work week, the, you know, versus Shabbos. What was good for your week, what was not so good for your week. It was very individualized. In Were sense. these things that people would share out loud or, or yeah. more come a note that... No, it was, uh, somebody would say that, pick, say something, and that would start a discussion. Or you, would, you had the option, it could just bring in something different to read. What kind of things would people bring in to read? Poetry that they were familiar with, or uh, an essay that some guy wrote. And do those work in general to bring in outside, really outside? They did. Places? They did mm -hmm. uh, for a period of time because the outside is pretty uh, is worked up too. I mean, you know. It's, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sure they don't do. That. First of all, I don't even know if they have Friday night services. But so was there use of musical instruments? Yeah. And that was always the case. Yes. Was that ever a point of discussion? Uh, I, I would guess the amount of it, mm -hmm. and whether you do nigunim, but but by and large it was up to the person leading, that's what they wanted, and if they had the capil capability of providing music, that's another. Or could, did they invite someone? Was there anybody, people who served as sort of song leaders? Leader? Well, yeah, and in the very beginning it was the band, so to speak. The David and Fiddlers, Fiddlers. Yeah, most of whom became Febrang and Fiddlers. I mean, there was a distinction, but, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was, went on for quite a while. <clears throat>
And were there any people outside of that who served as sort of leaders? Oh, yeah, 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 leaders? Uh, yeah, 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 you know, it's a, it's a compact service, mm -hmm. but it also took a long time. <laughs> Yeah, so a Friday night service is typically shorter, however, yeah. than a morning, Saturday morning service. Right, right. So, and... I mean, Saturday morning is also, they're more equal these days. Or, or my, I, I really don't know whether they're doing much in terms of Friday night at all. I don't know. Now, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what would people do about Shabbat dinner? When, what, when this service was, when the main gathering point was... A Kabbalah Shabbat service. Well, in the beginning, that went on for some time, it's right? Like, in the beginning, they got a nice meal out of it. That happened after, or I mean, it was a, it was a potluck or a communal meal, or it evolved into a potluck, uh, and I don't know what they do. Well, I don't think they really have a Friday night, but I could be wrong. Now you mean? Except they now they have a group in meets in Northern Virginia, as well as in uh, D.C. That group is more young, uh, middle-aged families, it mm -hmm. But back so to they the may very well be doing meals because right. it's a, a, a much but in smaller. In these early years, the first few years <coughs> of Fabrengen, it what was it? It was was it potluck or people people brought stuff or initially it was uh, a, a few people like us made the food. But that you know may have lasted a year or so, right. and then potluck is more common. They have that now. And that would be after the service. Yeah. So it was a whole evening, basically. Yeah. Of being together. Yeah. And then on Shabbat morning, did anything happen in There'd those be, er, in the early times? You mean in terms of like food, like a kiddush or something? No service. Was there a service? Oh yeah. Well, no. In the very beginning, uh, the service consist remained mainly the reading of the Torah study of the Torah. Then that evolved and to that was added periodically traditional stuff. Then as that's added, the other is reduced. The, the, the Torah discussion began, re reading and discussion began reduced. Yeah. So was there always something on Saturday morning? There was always at least this Torah discussion? Once I joined it, there was always something. Well, you were it, right? Well, I didn't sit by myself. Yeah. No, there were other people. Yeah. It, right. It's just we had to keep the point. It, it became a f practical issue. How much time did you want to do, do for the whole thing? And then how would you cut the time? So right. right. So that grew, that grew to be more the traditional thing with the exception of Musaf yeah. and Sukkot Yeah. Are are there any um, Torah discussions or Divrei Torah that stand out in your memory as something that sparked really heated or emotional discussion or um, feeling? I'm sure there were. Yeah. Okay. I don't remember necessarily. Actually, the one thing I do remember was off to the side, but it was very emotional. And that was on one Yom Kippur. Chava Weisler was doing something, you know, reading, make, uh, participating in the study. She was directing it that day. And her parents showed up. They lived there. They lived in Chevy Chase, as a matter of fact. And everybody but Chava realized they were there for a few minutes. And they had had some problems, you know. And uh, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but somebody said something and she looked up and saw her parents and she went over and hugged them. Hmm. A big deal. <laughs> Very emotional. Every one of us who have trouble with your parents, at some point everybody. And it really, I remember that very much. Yeah. Uh, you, let's, let's talk about women. Um, you, you said from the beginning at Verbrengen, women were able to participate fully in the service? Yes. Mm -hmm. Women were counted in the minion? 
Yes. From the beginning. Yes. Um, do you remember women wearing... There was, in fact, an interesting discussion about that. Uh, one member wanted to do require 20, 10 and 10. But reason took place. <laughs> reason prevails. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you recall women wearing tulesim? Pretty much from the beginning. Yeah. From the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to what extent would you say you and, and other people at Fabrengen were really aware of the nascent Jewish feminist movement as it was starting to take shape with Ezra and Nashim in 71 and efforts to include women? Well, we included, as I say, from the beginning, uh, and started classes soon after the first year so that women could participate knowledgeably. Right. So there was a lag from well, when you started to when well, women started actually leading davening, women started laning. Uh -huh. It was uh, a lag. Gap. Yeah, it was a knowledge gap. And, and individuals moved at different periods. Mm -hmm. And some knew a lot already, like Chava is very ed well educated, and, uh, and some people didn't know anything. But it was a step-by-step. A, a step. Yeah. Um, and adults but mitzvahs were It started way before they did in regular synagogues. Exactly. Yeah. In uh, something like 70... It was in the set early 70s. Yeah. Um, and a women's group. Right. It started to be, was established in 73. Um, do you remember anything about, uh, 73 was when the first adult bat mitzvah took place at Fabrengen, which was early. Uh -huh. Do you remember where that, you remember that occasion? Do you yes. Remember, can you describe it? Uh, again, it was a family actually that came together. Uh, which was nice. They participated. And it was otherwise a straightforward. You know, they did as much as they could. So some people, it was a Torah service. So, uh, so there were several women who were involved. But in the in first one, no, in the first time, it was just like anybody else, which was sequential or part particles brought together. And uh, but then the classes took place for the, because people didn't have the knowledge or feel they had the knowledge. They would have been allowed to do it anyway, or they were allowed to do it anyway, but people wanted more. Yeah. So it really wasn't coming from the community as such. It was the community was supporting... Individuals yeah. who were interested. Yeah, but they had classes. Uh, do you remember the, can you describe at all the feel of any of these? Oh, it was, it, in the very beginning, it felt, um, uh, it felt, always felt good, or, but, or not necessarily relevant to the, in anything, it was assumed. But in the very beginning, it was another element of, of uh, freedom and uh, growth, very much, yeah. And people were very different in their manner of learning that they were comfortable with. And what do you mean? They may have wanted to do, some may have said, oh, I don't know enough to be that, I should take a class. Others might say, I know plenty, I can do it in English, it'd be just as good. You know. uh, we didn't dwell on whether they were capable or not. But the, the tendency clearly was the direction of the uh, of the of the learning, the the group. Some then stayed in a group as they did if they didn't feel comfortable. That's the personal thing. But most did did something. Yeah. Okay. So, is there anything else you want to say about tefillah and services? No. I mean, it was a big part of. Especially in the beginning. Oh, it's a big part. Is even more in, when it's not in the beginning because you have other things. But uh, it was the center of the Torah service was Torah reading study that I described, 
and the singing at different places were the two important components that changed the, the feeling of the place. Coming from such a strong halachic background as you did, did you find the services fulfilling? Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't... There's always a lot of acronyms that are put in, additions that are put in that are not necessary. And some then they might argue about which is more important. So, but that, the music was very important, and then there were other things. There were dances, movements. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, Rochelle and Your wife. my wife and Arthur. Wasco. did a lot of movement stuff and together with music his contribution to the music part was rather limited <laughs> but the idea you know somebody getting up and doing that and not worrying about being made a fool was certainly there yeah. so let's turn to uh, the role of study and learning which we've talked a little bit about um, how, how did the Chabura, uh envision the role of teachers and learners with Flexible. bringing classes? Flexible. What does that mean? Sometimes a person is a student, sometimes they were a teacher. But um, since Judaism has a core of learning that's in a different language, here it's not the same as it would just be if you had an English service or something like that. But we, we always had classes outside of the davening as well as the davening. From the beginning? Yeah, from the beginning. Uh, and were people recruited as teachers or did they volunteer as teachers? How did, how did, how did, the, how did classes um, become part of the curriculum that was being taught in any given moment? Well, again, nobody was required to take it. No such thing was required. <laughs> but it was made clear that it was desired to everybody, including the person who was doing it. Although people are different and feeling comfortable. Uh, they we're not, out, we're not out to make people feel discomforted. But most wanted some degree of education. And certainly to have a bat mitzvah that required and many, I, most of the times that I've been at such things, their family comes, their friends come. Right. It's a real but adult but bat mitzvah is real. Did you get involved in teaching? I personally. Yeah. Yeah. What what kinds of things would you teach? Uh, well, initially the structure of the service kind of detail, so that it's more traditional. And then things, uh, ethical issues that might come up, it's more of a to kind of Torah discussion focus. Mm -hmm. and what is, does this feel real to you, or is it just some kind of phony, bony thing, you know, history? Then there's, there were plenty of people who uh, could teach in addition, and always did. I always did. Were there classes that you that you took as a as a learner? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What what did you want to study personally? Talmud. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, who was there, for instance, who who could teach Talmud? Uh, uh, Max Stickton and my cousin Norman Shore. Do you know Norman? Hey, He's from you? Boston. I know his name. I don't know oh, him personally. Okay. Yeah. He was very good. Was he part of the community? He yeah, was and is. And is. Uh, so he's still in Washington. Yeah. Still at for bringing. Um, when was the uh, the Jewish Study Center launched, and what was its relationship to the early these early classes? That mm -hmm. were well, the, in the first summer that we were there, we had a summer institute. So seventy one. <clears throat> Summer of 71. Yeah. 
and then the next step was a uh, together with other people with people who were not in Fabrengen otherwise a Jewish studies center without capital it was more based on the uh, Lair House model of Martin Luther and Franz Rosenzweig and so forth and then that moved into the Jewish Study Center, which was a series of classes over a, with a monthly kind of structure. Is it still a, a Lairhouse kind of structure? A little bit more teacher-oriented, a little bit less the other, but that's because who their teachers were. <laughs> um, Anyway, so there is that. That's been for a number of years. And, and that was set up, the Jewish Studies Center, as something independent of Fabrengen. Always? It was always independent of Fabrengen? It was founded as, it is intended to be uh, not controlled by Fabrengen, but rather this Jewish Studies thing, because that made more people uh, happy to get something. Once the Jewish Studies Center was established in 73, did Fabrengen continue to also offer other classes? Not in the beginning so much. Maybe there were a learning class here or there. But uh, once the Jewish Center really got going, its core membership and certainly teachers was from Fabrengen. But the, over the time, that's changed and it's become more independent. But also now, it has much fewer students, partly because the synagogues have uh, increased. Their adult mm -hmm. learning, I mean, offerings. Offerings, yeah. yeah. There was a, a symposium to study the writings of Martin uh, Buber. Mm -hmm on his 10th yard site in 1975 that Verbrengen was involved in sponsoring. Uh, yes, and uh, Arthur and I were the, the uh, staff for the thing. Mm -hmm. I read all the Boober books possible, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been something. Can you tell us a little bit about the symposium? Well, I, it was funny, or not so funny, that uh, most of the people had never heard of Martin Buber or much about him. And here it was, you know, it seemed like until you actually worked on it, oh, this must have happened 30 years ago, you know, or 50 years ago, or 100 years ago. It was only 10 years that it, you know. So, And it was relevant. He was asking the same kind. He was the modern questioner. Does this make sense? Is this something that, you know, there's a whole thing, whether he was, he knew what he was talking about with the Hasidim, Hasidish stories that he picked and the philosophy. We didn't worry about that. That's for the academic world to argue over such matters. But uh, in general, he was one of the people cited often. Uh, sometimes people would give a small story as the bizarre, bizarre Torah. You know. A Buber says, yeah. one of his stories. Yeah. 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 So, was it well attended? The, what? The symposium. The 10th yes, it was. anniversary yeah, symposium. Yeah, yeah. The, um, um, actually, to show you how things Go, the main speaker about his over life over his development in life was my father, because he wrote a book about Buber, and Buber was included in the book, and uh, so. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of scholarly people. Uh, es Esther Tickton's brother is was knowledgeable in that. He's a psychoanalyst, but he was also. A Buberian. What's his name? And that's a good question. Um, what about the Verbring in Cheder? When did that get started and what, what was the impetus for getting that children's program going? Yeah, 
there were enough kids who weren't getting educated because it was not the focal point of the, and we couldn't cover all bases. So a number of families that had educable aged children got together. And an informal thing that we did over the years was the label Fabrangen would be used. The Fabrangen Cheder. The Fabrangen this, the Fabrangen that. Which was nice, because it kind of, you on your own, we, we didn't control the the Cheder at all, but we were saying they're part of our group, positively part of the group. Form of branding almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was started, was it not, by people who were who members of Fabrangen? But that's not their only life. This was members of Fabrangen Cheder. Yeah. So to this day, if you see something writing about it, it will say the Fabrangen Cheder. Um, you know Sue Romer? You know the name, Sue Romer. So she appeared on the scene. Actually, it's a good, good example. She would, uh, it came from a Yiddish background, a secular Yiddish background. And she, we had a uh, quote-unquote coffee house uh, in the early days, and she showed up and did her Yiddish songs, and they were wildly popular. <laughs> she was a good singer, but it was way beyond that. It was the motion of Yiddish uh, and stuff. Then when her kids got older, she was behind this. She wanted them to have a Jewish education, traditional Jewish education. So she started that, and Arthur also had younger children. Who did? Arthur, and other people like that. So it was a mixture of adults and studies and children. And the role of Fabrangen, by and large, was to help provide teachers. And help with uh, money and a variety of stuff. Yeah. But again, no effort to control. After the initial period of Fabrengen and, and once the Federation had stopped its funding, how, how did the place of political activism evolve as a focus for communal activity and interest? For social activity? Well, it had always been there and it didn't change. That part didn't change. I, I thought you were asking about payment of raising money and things like that. No. no. Yeah. Oh, no. No, that was just the normal. So, I guess, let me try to clarify what I was yeah. asking. Social, I mean, social activism, anti-war activities, all of those kinds of uh, varieties of activism had been really central in the very beginning. Um, alongside these other things, did it? Did that change? Did the place yes. of social activism yeah. change? Yes. And how so? Well, it wasn't so much the uh, role of the organization itself, but of people who were interested in various things. So, for example, there were trees for Vietnam. <laughs> what are trees for Vietnam? Trees for Vietnam were like uh, the trees. That is real. Yeah. yeah. But also the rebirth of vegetation as the war was being attacked and reduced. And so, forth. so it served a political point as well as a social uh, good activity, you know. The trees were being planted where? In Vietnam. In Vietnam. Yeah. In areas where there had been trees. It was a good idea. Was it a successful program? For the first couple of years. Then got to be old hat already. And it didn't attract a zillion people. There was one woman, um, uh, what's her name? Oh, she's little, good voice. Pam, Pam Hoffman. Her parents were members of the Chavrat Shalom. Or at least they were friendly with uh, Arthur mm -hmm. Green. But in any case, she was the staff person for that prep. It got paid. Not a lot of money, but. Yeah. 
tensions over varying attitudes towards Israel and Palestine and Israel's policies were clearly central in the very early months of uh, for Reagan's existence. But once UGA declined to continue f the funding, um, what role did Israel and its role in Jewish life play in for Reagan as it moved forward? Celebrating 36 years in 2007. <laughs> One of the anniversaries of Fabrengen was, I think, the 36th anniversary. This is what it is. So, rabbi, who have become rabbis and cantors. Page 12, you turn to page 12. <laughs> Current and former in Verbrenners. Current and former Verbrenners who are rabbis, are cantors, and have settled permanently in Israel. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. So isn't that something? It's just to show you that a lot had been accomplished in a period of time without any money and without this or without that. And here is all the members for that time period. 36 anniversary fund. If you gave a little bit of money, this is a Jewish group after all. You get your name in this. Room. This is the from 91, from 71 to 2000. So. Huh. And list the various people who were, given that we didn't have real members, <laughs> it's a list of members. Anyway. And I had a lot of people who became rabbis and cantors. How many people do you think were on that list, more or less, who actually made Aliyah and moved to Israel? Twenty or so. Twenty or so. And that was a while ago. That was already. But that was yeah. At at thirty six, I and mean, we're we're at maybe forty five or so now. Years, something like that, right? Well, forty eight was nineteen forty. It's fifty two. Seventy. We're talking about for Brendan, so yeah. it's seventy one. Oh, okay. Right. 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 Um, uh, so you were a member of Bray Rot, is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, during this period. What drew you to that organization, and how were you involved in it? Well, its goals seemed to be good to me. The goals seemed to be good to me, and honest and virtuous and worth a try. Um, I'm not anti-Israel by any remote way of determining, but it doesn't mean that I don't think that without dealing with the Palestinians at some level that there will ever be a peace. And I, I think it's possible and it can be accomplished. So yesh Brera is there is an alternative. You know, the, the opposite is there is no choice. There is a choice. It would be hard to do, but worthy of trying. Would you say that different responses to Israel caused tensions within the community back in that those early years, or no? No. No. People accepted variety. There are about uh, 70 people that have, in some form or another, spent significant time in Israel. In Israel. Okay. Actually, one of my friends in uh, law school his name is Louis Liner, L-A-I-N-E-R. He's from California. And he was president for one, or the leader, or whatever, of uh, Israel. New, what, what? The New Israel? Uh-huh. He has family money and has used it. And he's done a few other things, too. So that's a good, that's a good he's a good example because he's very pro-Israel but he's very pro coming up with some kind of solution. Right. Okay. So, for Brengen, you, you and, and later your family, together with you, were involved with for Brengen for a period of about 15 years, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and it continued to spawn offshoots um, and to develop programs in the larger Jewish community. Can, I just want to touch briefly on the ones that you think 
uh, were, were significant, most significant, um, just to get a sense of how Verbrengen continued to evolve um, over, because this, this project is really focused on those very early years, mm -hmm. but Verbrengen actually started three years later than Havarat Shalom and, mm -hmm. and sort of its continuing development through the 70s and 80s and even beyond are something that I want to at least mention. So um, you mentioned Fabrengen Fiddlers. Uh, what about the coffee house? You just alluded to it a minute ago. Was it Tzedek Tzedek Coffee House? Was it? Mm -hmm. That's what I've read. Well, if you read it, it must be accurate. How about the Tzedakah Collective? That's an interesting model because that still lives. It started off with uh, everybody would commit would commit to f contributing, but also to analyzing different groups that could use the money well, fairly, properly, and so forth. So many people came up that two had to be established. Two two collectives. Because the whole one of the points is you get together with people and hash it out. You can't have too many people doing it. Doesn't work. So for a number of years it was two. Then did lose some members and they've maintained one, but they're still in business. How many people were in the sort of ideal number? What was the ideal number in a, in a, in a Tzedakah collection? Around, 20, many? around 25. Around like 25? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and so they would go through a process of making decisions, ha having educated themselves about potential recipients. Then there was an offshoot of that. There was a woman named Rita Poretsky. Mm -hmm. She was a Fabrenga person from early on and uh, has had a fair amount of money, a couple million. Uh, and she became ill. Uh, and her, both she and her mother had the same illness, some kind of cancer of the uterus or some, something. But she didn't have any children, so I don't know. In any case, uh, she set up a, a charitable trust, and that increased the amount of money that could be given. It's not officially through the Tzedakah Collectives, but by providing information about projects, you know. She at least can have a voice. Yeah. In that. Very nice. Um, what can you tell us about Fabrengen's role in co-sponsoring the Jewish Folk Arts Festival? So, uh, David Schneer is a key person here right. in that. But uh, he was active in Fabrengen at the time, so he actually came to the community at a community meeting and asked for support, and uh, mainly financial support, and then people to help with logistics. Uh, it was universally supported. And we have a record here somewhere of uh, Rochelle Helsner in the <laughs> your wife. Self serving things. Yes, yeah. indeed. Indeed. Are there any other significant um, sort of programs that you want to mention? Because otherwise I want to move to the question of retreats. Retreats? retreats. We never retreat. <laughs> okay. Um, so Weiss's Weiss's farm. Yeah. Outside of the sort of immediate Fabrengen family, there were gatherings of Jews involved in the early Chavarot that started taking place early in the 70s also. Um, only. Only. It, only. Was, it was the three groups who we're now Chavar talking Shalom, about. Nur Chavara, and Fabrengen. Yeah, right. And we, I don't remember how Michael and I both said at the same time, but whatever. That this was something to do. Michael Strasfeld, yeah. So we did, and uh, some outsiders came, but basically, the idea was a three, well, three times the year to have a, a retreat, coinciding with uh, Shalosh Regalim of America and Israel. <laughs> what do you mean, America and Israel? Well, it was easy to pick the one for the summer and the fall. But not so easy. Meaning Shavuot and, and Sukkot. Yeah. We could have done Pesach or whatever. But we made one that was... Uh, well, maybe we did that. Must, no, I don't think we did. Because of the Sidorim, hard to do Pesach. So we did it around the winter time. Anyway. 
And the American holidays are things like Labor Day and Columbus Day and whatever. But it worked out. It was great, actually. That just worked out. And there was a moment when, which was very important, some guy, a guy I don't remember his name, got up at some point and accused, uh, he, he wouldn't give names, but the, one group does not follow the practice of, use, of mainly relying on experts in terms of Judaism to teach Torah. In other words, what did Rashi have to say? What did this... You know, this one of the th groups being one of the th these three chavarot? So I was about to get up and defend, you know, but it wasn't necessary. Everybody said, no, it's great to have Rashi, but it's, it's not the end of the, of the world. And uh, it's legitimate what people have to say. All of, one of the key points of the chavarot movement is that it's legitimate to say things that sound outrageous otherwise. So, it was a great, it was a great moment. That, that person was kind of shouted down by the other people. When, and it was just, it was just, you know, really an example of a moment when things could have been limited or bifurcated and destroyed or building multiple centers. Different, but committed to the helping each other right. as well. And yet, e each of these Chavarot had developed independently. Did you learn uh, things from each other's experiences and models that you wanted to take back and, and try and innovate and experiment with within your own community of Fabregan? Yeah. What, for instance? Well, the... Uh, Emphasis on singing in the in the service was a little bit more than there. The authenticity of the sense of the spirit within you is something that they contributed to us, or from getting from us. It was. Can you clarify that? They felt the, the people at least who spoke to us <laughs> and said, you know, for Brangen is fantastic. I remember actually. Um, uh, what's his name, who's now both at Fabrengen and the New York Chavara. Uh, he, he does inter interfaith work. Oh, um, who we just, Jerry Serrata. Yeah, Jerry Serrata. So he was in the New York Chavara, hadn't yet appeared in the D.C. arena. But he said, after it, he's now, these people speak of God. They, it's really an integral part of who they are. We don't. And, that, and he sat down. You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. we help, and we help to, you know, we, they're exclusive, but that helps them bring out this, you know, the Chavrat Shalom. Mm -hmm. It was a, it's not the model of Fabrengen. That, you know, with us, the more that come, the merrier. In their case, still, I guess, you have to be admitted or something. I don't know. No, no, no it hasn't okay. been for years. Okay. Well, I keep up. <laughs> anyway, it's that kind of thing. But yeah. Plus, the, the Weisses themselves are a unique. Weisses of Weisses Farm. Who, who, what, and who are the Weisses, and what, in fact, was Weisses Farm? They're both survivors. They had lost a lot of family members. It's a couple. They are a couple. And they are committed to making sure that young Jewish people have Jewish experience and have life joy in their life. And they were just great, funny, involved. You know, so since we're in, there are three times in the year, it's enough time to keep up with somebody. Yeah. And they're matzah brai. He's famous for his matzah brai. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you were there for Passover. Maybe I missed it that I was there. No, well, anyway, yeah. And they have a son who's a real nice guy. Made Aliyah. Some people have uh, mentioned the retreats at Weiss's farm as incubators, essentially, of interesting ideas that percolated and were discussed within this group of membership from all the Chavarot that 
then really took on a life of their own. I was wondering, I, I think it was Sharon Strassfeld who uh, mentioned uh, the idea of Tzedakah Collectives as a, something that was incubated in conversations at the retreats at Weiss's Farm, which then were established also in New York City. Um, does that resonate for you, the idea of Weiss's yeah. Farm as an, sort of a place of incubating? It was one of the things that did it, yeah. Mm -hmm. How important was the idea of uh, sort of creating a sense of uh, fellowship among members of the different Havarot in terms in terms of building a larger sense of community? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, the expansion of what of who they were and what we are and everything was certainly useful to everybody in the first number of years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the first one unintentionally was involved with the end of the Yom Kippur War. That was the first one? I think so. But it was one of them if it wasn't the first one, but I think it was the first one. Mm -hmm. The challenge was pretty great to hold together, um, but it succeeded. Why, why was... Why? Well, people were very in a very emotional state. And, uh, you know, and had been, all of us had been charged at different times with not being Jewish enough, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to move into the sort of last reflection section, um, where I'd like to focus more on, on your thoughts about how this period of your involvement with Fabrengen affected your own life moving forward. and and also your reflections on the broader impact of, of the Havara on American Jewish life. So you and your family were active in Fabrega from its inception in 71 for some 15 years, and, and then you moved to a new community. Um, was that for work, or when, why did you move away from it? Well, I moved to, we moved here. Mm -hmm. And the reason was uh, Rochelle is the cantor, but that cantor is in Rockville. So we kind of compromised. We came up to here from downtown, but that still gave her a chance to get to. What did you do about finding a Jewish community for, your, for yourselves and, and your family at that point? Well, that was a compromise as well. Uh, in selecting the neighborhood, we required one that we could walk to, which wasn't so easy. <laughs> but Orkotish was such a place. It's about a mile away. And walking there was generally easy. Yeah. And biking. Hmm? And biking. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that was what kind of community is Rokotish? It's a middle-of-the-road conservative synagogue. Mm -hmm. But I, there was the one telling you about the little effort used to get acceptance of women. In, in so can you tell, tell us about that? What were some of the... Well, for years it was a right-wing conservative synagogue, and in particular on women issues. They thought if they gave somebody the right to speak on behalf of a committee, that that was, that's not true. I mean, but the point is that women couldn't really do it. Um, and there was a great deal of interest in their moving. So when I met uh, the rabbi at a, an event elsewhere, and he said, we're all, we're going to change this very quickly. So after 10 or so years, or <laughs> whatever it was, it seemed like the end of the world, uh, he said he took serious thought of it, but he's holding it to his position. So uh, the building underwent in a period of being fixed and upgraded and all that kind of stuff. And people were out of there for a period of time of, for about the year because it was too much stuff. So there was davening in a trailer. Well, you can't have <laughs> certain things in a trailer, one of them being the mechitza. Uh, 
Not that we had a mechitz here, but I mean, you know, we couldn't count it. So things began to change. <clears throat> uh, and basically he uh, gave in or advanced to, but the role of women uh, became normative. Mm. I understand that when you first left for Brengen, because of this move that you you were involved in starting a sort of informal chavara, the egalitarian chavara style minion that met in people's homes. Met in our home. Met in your home. <laughs> what happened with that effort? Oh, uh, uh, Jonah's sister was born. <laughs> it was just too much. My father died, she was born. It was just too... so, not to be. Right. So that's when you actually explored joining or coach. Yeah. And, and became a That meant I had to put time into that aspect of it. Yeah, energy. Right. Okay. So this sounds like it was a challenging period. Um, yeah, that particular th issue. Yeah. That particular issue. So what, what would you say have been the enduring aspects of the Ferengen vision that have continued to motivate you in your own sort of Jewish journey? Well, <laughs> it's a very different place. You, it can be good and, and not be the same. Uh, and it can be only fair and not be the same. What's the it? It is the style of community building. Okay. There, there's a lot of teaching that goes on. Uh, in fact, um, a guy named Richard Friedman, who was active in Weiss's Farm, and he went to, uh, in Israel, uh, what's a yeshiva kind of, but a liberal Roshiva, I can't remember. Anyway, he gives courses that are like what a rabbi would give, you know, on text, in other words. And, and people could do that if they want. And that's, it's, it's open to that in particular learning. The level of learning may not be so high, um, but the fact of it, you know, and uh, it's also caring. The, I, I think today most of the shoals are this way. Mm -hmm. They have increased learning, accepted opinions of different things, care for each other to some degree, you know, not uh, immense, but to some degree they all have com committees that help people get through problems and things. Yeah. yeah. So where has your where have you and your family landed for uh, sort of a spiritual home? Is it Rochelle's synagogue at this point, where she's cantor? Yeah. Well, she's the cantor there, and uh, she also is the program kind of person as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not so much involved in the organizational stuff, but some. Mm -hmm. Are there ways in which you you'd say that your your Jewish life and ideas about Judaism have diverged from what you thought during your Fabrengan days and certainly the early Fabrengan days? I don't think it's as exciting as the Fabrengan was, but I don't think the Fabrengan is as exciting as it was. So, mm -hmm. you know, different. Different things become motivating factors. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the children, and uh, we hope to have other children of a different type. <laughs> Small children. <laughs> <laughs> Rochelle's family lives here, the extended family lives here. Mm -hmm. So that's good for her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's fine. Yeah. It sounds like there's had to be a fair amount of sort of compromise just for reasons of different life stages as well as opportunities. Yeah, it coincided with um, an issue that developed, which was this question of uh, 
how do you phrase this? Oh, I know. The Eloheinu versus Ovinu's versus the Imahut. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Big issue of our day. Previous day, actually. Can you elaborate? So it's whether in the Mita we talked about, women talk about God, God the mothers, well mothers, mothers included. So at, in the beginning of that coming up, my position was and it wasn't the end of the world position, but you know, that actually it says the God of Abraham, the God of Abraham, and the Imahot. But the reason, so, so Moshe is not part of the of Inu, it's the three particular guys who had a particular uh, relationship with God. It doesn't mean that other people can't or would and didn't, but they're other people. And the way the Torah presents it's pretty much, very much, the men who, who, are, who carry the thing. Doesn't mean that women couldn't carry, but historically, men did. So, I thought another name would be a good idea for the women, rather than just repeating, calling them mothers instead of fathers. Uh, other people thought differently, so, so. Whatever the decision was, it would be wise. So, so that, that's really what happened. Um, that was seen incorrectly as related to the move. We had a move because of her uh, work. Hmm. Yeah. But you're, you're saying people saw your departure as, right. as related to the Imahot right. decision, but it wasn't really. No. I mean, I disagreed with a bit of So what? Right. Yeah. No. Yeah, and I, you know, it it moved actually closer, to, way closer to where we are, but so so does uh, positions, and so. To switch gears for a minute. You've had a long career in both. Uh, public and, and private sectors at the intersection and the intersections between them in which you focused on um, the development of affordable housing and otherwise promoting community empowerment for relatively poor areas and groups of people um, with limited financial and other resources. How, if at all, do you see your work as connected to your Jewish values and the vision of what it has meant to you to live a what you've called the holistic Jewish life? Well, I think it's very, very important, obviously, um, because it, you're putting some a problem before the society and using your value system to come up with a solution, solutions. And uh, the single uh, program that is today and that has been for the last few years for low-income housing is something called the housing tax credit, low-income housing tax credit. And uh, that replaced certain other programs, but still was a big step forward, and I played a major role in that. So that's the kind of activity that I'm interested in continuing. I'm not sure that's going to happen, but uh, especially for change of leadership in our country as we yes. approach the inauguration of Donald Trump. Yes. Yeah. Um, you've lived your life as, I think you would still say, as a Holocaust Jew. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak for a minute to your vision for, how, your, your, your vision for growth and change and how it relates to your understanding of Torah and the tension between Midrash and Halakha, something that we've talked about earlier, but it seems like it's a thread that has run through your life from the time that you were very young and first thinking about these all the way through your you know, deeper, deepest sort of commitments today, and feelings about what's important. Mm -hmm. So what you're referring to is the sense that the vision of something 
is important. Taking the vision and making it work is very important. And that's what I hope to be, to have been doing in my uh, latter years. <laughs> but uh, actually, you know, since I've already told you of, I have memory problems, uh, I haven't yet figured out how to relate that to this source for uh, meaningful connections. But I'm sure they're there, yeah. and uh, hope to find them, Mirz Hashem, in the coming. Um, so looking back over nearly, it's nearly half a century. <laughs> it's hard to believe of hard to the development believe. of Havra in American Jewish life. What, what would you say have been the Havra's most important contributions and impact? And it's opened up the beauty of our tradition and the reality of God's presence. Now, it's not the only group that does that, but I think that's what it's what the groups we have have in common, a continuing search for ways to do that and to make it better. When you say it's not the only group, are you thinking of other groups within within Jew the Jewish world or beyond or both? Uh, beyond, I would say, but but still real. A real component doesn't get lost in the mishmash of of entities. Judaism is a great model, and the more that we can do, the, we, the less likely we are to get presidents like we got. So, can you unpack that a little? In what sense? Is Judaism a great model for? In what way? A, a life of service and of enjoyment. It's got to you got to have all these different elements to make it work, but uh, it's there. All the ones we've been discussing. Yeah. Tfila. Yeah, and, I, and I'm lucky to have uh, met people in all of those organizations who you can see or, can see uh, are co truly committed to improving things. Yeah. And then we also have to figure out how to solve the situation in Israel. And, uh, not easy. Not easy. But I think our ancestors in that long time, but recent ones, to have gotten through the Holocaust and miseries like that makes this relatively small. But it's real. It's quite real. Yes, indeed. And as we were just mentioning, we're on the cusp of the inauguration of Donald Trump as yeah. President of the United States. So at this moment of challenge, right, what many people conceive of as challenge, are there lessons that you think the Havara experiment sort of can impart to us for a path forward as we think about finding productive pathways for change and sustaining uh, sort of the movement in, 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 in dir progressive direct directions, mm -hmm. holistic directions. Yeah. I would say the existing conservative, uh, conservative synagogues need just a tad more participatory music and storytelling. But the real changes in the world are for all people, all different people. But they all have to share and do share in the search for ways of combining vision and path. And we, uh, we have had it for a long time. Maybe we can help teach them that it isn't easy or, easy or either or. And it doesn't uh, depend on charismatic leaders. Depends on all of us feeling the need and the, the great opportunities to change aspects of life in the world. Given the energy that you feel around you now, does that leave you feeling optimistic? Or not? I, you know, I think who knows, but I, he may actually des desire to make a greater influence, and to do that, he's got to change, be closer to the rest of us. So, for that reason, it could work. from your mouth to God's ears. You hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.